Good evening, y'all. Welcome back to another Sunday night Fundamentals of Arduino stream. On this beautiful Sunday evening here in Chicago, where I am, where tonight I'll just get the plug out of the way right at the top of things. I am drinking a delicious Fist City from Revolution Brewing Company, um, where those of you who didn't hear the story a couple weeks ago, it's where my wife and I got married just a little over a year ago. Um, really great place, so a nice thing to have a Nice cold drink of them here on this Sunday night as we unwind after the end of a long week. Well, I didn't even start our uh, our countdown timer till we do nerdy things. I don't know where my head is at this week. We'll try and get it in the game here as we start up. Hi, some familiar faces here. Chris is here, Michael, Brian. Expensive choice, but great. Yeah, it, it, Revolution's a little bit pricey, but it's, gosh, it's so tasty. What are y'all drinking tonight? Even if it's just water. Like, I know, I know there are people for whom alcohol is not the thing, and that's totally cool. Um, but, uh, for me tonight, a beer sounds really good. Oh, very tasty. As always, we're going to give people who are straggling just a couple minutes to, uh, to catch up to us before we dive in. Little spoilers of what's coming up tonight here on the table. Ooh, got some Two Brothers, Water, and Snaggletooth Bandana. I don't know, Chris, if that's a drink or a fashion choice or what's happening there. It sounds exciting. I also am drinking water tonight because hydration is important. Oh, and we'll have a good old time. We're going to, as always, trying to keep this to a tight 90. I know we, we have yet to do that. We never have. Um, last week's session where we talked about, what did we talk about last week? Transistors and FETs and uh, doing high power things was not our longest stream yet. That was two weeks ago. That Fundamentals of uh, Electricity stream was uh, two hours and 45 minutes. So... Almost a double class. It's like, I don't know how many of you had block schedule in high school, um, but where you'd have like the days where you'd have like a short little class and then you'd have other days where you'd have every other class for twice as long. So in that sense, like the last two streams have been, um, have been the block schedule of streaming, except that we're still continuing to do them every week, I suppose. So maybe the metaphor's not perfect. Mm. Having some water, having some hydration out there. Chris says, uh, Solemn Oath Brewery in Naperville. Ooh, that sounds very good. A very tasty brew. Um, yeah, tonight. Well, 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 we'll give ourselves another minute and six seconds here, and, uh, and then we'll get to what we're doing tonight. This we'll we'll get to a little bit later. Um, but I'm excited for tonight. We're gonna we're gonna try some new things. We're gonna learn some new stuff, and we're gonna write a lot of code. Um, and I think that will be really exciting. Um, yeah, got a few new supplies this week. I got my new uh, my order of breadboards finally came in the mail, which is good because I want to keep all of the old demos that we've been doing for weeks and weeks around, and I was running out of breadboards to put them on. Um, so now I have another, like, 12 breadboards to play with. Some of them are this, like, adorable little half-size breadboard, which is super cute, which for a little pocket demo like this one that we'll see later tonight is kind of perfect. Um, so, and I've also got some other some other full-size ones when we're doing a larger demo like this one that we'll see later tonight. I have enough room to spread out on. Breadboards mostly, by the way, interlink together. If you have multiples of them, I don't know if we've talked about this, but a lot of them have these little... Um, We'll get a little ahead of ourselves. Have these little tabs on the on the ends, which are meant to interlock with the tabs on adjacent breadboards, at least breadboards of the same size. Like these two are two different size ones, so you see the tabs don't line up. But if I have two identical breadboards, I can lock them together and make a double width breadboard or lock them end to end, you can see there as well, and make a double length one. So they're they're a little bit more configurable, which is nice. In fact, this this on the table here, which is our end of the night demo, is two breadboards linked together in the middle here, and then they're just glued down to this piece of metal for convenience sake. Um, so anyway, fun little breadboard tip to start the night. But let's get the night started. Um, tonight we're going to talk about tying together all of the things that we have been talking about so far. Um, I, I know some of you may have seen when I originally put up the like promo for tonight, it was called like making a game, which is what we're going to do tonight. By the end of tonight, we're going to take a bunch of the skills that we've learned so far and tie them all together into making a a playable game for the Arduino. Uh, and why a game? Well, you know, so far we've been exploring sort of individual skills. How do you read a button? How do you light up an LED? How do you control a servo motor? And we've kind of been doing them in isolation, right? Here's 10 lines of code that turns a servo motor back and forth. You know, here's six lines of code that reads a button and prints it to the serial command, right? When you're doing something in an application setting, like playing a game, 
controlling a robot, flying a plane, taking sensor readings and applying them to do something else. You often are doing a lot of different things in real time. And that's a skill that we haven't touched on all that much yet. Um, so tonight, we're going to spend just a little bit of the first time um, building in one more output skill, right? When we think about our, our categories of thing we can learn, we have our inputs, we have our outputs, and we have our thinking that glues them together. Um, so we're going to spend the first little bit talking about shift registers as an output. We're going to use those to build a game. And where we build up, we're going to build a, a, a real-time game that takes input from buttons and puts outputs onto a little 8x8 LED matrix display. This is one of the things that we requested uh, people wanted to look at because they have it and they're getting started with Arduino kits. So this will be the output for, uh, for our project today. Ooh, a cup of organic chicken broth. That sounds very healthy. That sounds great. Ah, so let's dive in. So yeah, so this is some of the things we're talking about today. Shift registers, controlling that little LED matrix. Um, Two-dimensional arrays will be a programming construct they were introduced fairly early. But the main focus of tonight is program flow. As we make this sort of, or we'll be making a, a fun game, you can think of this as skills that apply to building any real-time application. Let's start by figuring out how we turn on these little 8x8 LED matrices. Um, you may have got... Um, but they essentially all work the same way. So I'm going to be using this 8x8 one because that seems to be sort of the most common size that's floating around in your kits out there. Um, but just know that if you have a differently sized one, um, the code we write today with a couple of small modifications and the hardware that we set up to drive it will work with just about any size of... Uh, of these displays, you might just need to do a little extra footwork to figure out what the actual connections are, because of course you will have more or less LEDs than I actually do here. So to drive these LED matrices, um, I want to just quickly flash back to what we learned last week about driving our seven segment displays, because the methodology that we use to drive them is going to be very, very similar. Um, you'll remember that when we originally drove a single digit display, that was two weeks ago, right? So, you know, in prehistory, we drove this single digit display. Um, ours was common anode, which remember means we hook up the positive voltage down here in one place, and then we selected which of the other segments of the uh, of the display we were going to connect to ground. And whichever one we did, that let uh, current flow through an LED segment and light up certain segments of that display to make a number of our choosing, right? So for one digit, that was fine. But when we needed to make a multi-digit display, we used this uh, multiplexing technique where we still connected the the uh, the cathodes the downstream side the negative side of each of those segments together connected them to individual digital pins and then we last week we used PNP transistors to select which of the digits we were applying a positive voltage to um, so that we if we turned on positive voltage to say only digit one and then grounded its cathodes we'd see only digit one and then we turn that off turn on the positive voltage to digit two and ground some with cathodes and make that digit and so on and if we do that fast enough then we end up with this this multiplexing idea where you know things are turning on and off so fast that the human eye or for our purposes tonight the camera uh, can't see that they're actually flicking and changing we just see a persistent image across all of them right so this idea of um, using some some selective lines to sometimes provide a positive voltage and selecting from that point which of the uh, which of the downstream which of the cathode which of the negative lines to pull down to ground so you can actually create the digits that's very similar to how we're going to be driving our um, our LED matrix displays tonight um, so just to get into it a little bit here's what's going on inside an LED matrix oh, oh I, got, I got a little ahead of myself this is another picture of what we just talked about right so inside this seven segment display we have a common connection in our case a, a common anode display we've got positive in one place and then we can choose which of these negative sides which of these cathodes to connect to ground inside our Arduino and when we do, we select which of these segments to turn on for that digit. And then we step individually through each of those digits very quickly in turn, if that makes sense. Um, so here's what's going on inside your LED matrix display. Um, in my case, I have an eight row, eight column display. So each of those rows and each of those uh, columns are connected to a single pin. Um, and uh, they are connected in such a way that if you were to... Uh, turn on, say, in the, say a single row, let's say uh, we'll turn on row one here, 
and then ground rows uh, 1, 3, and 5, you would have LEDs 1, 3, and 5 light up. Uh, if you were to then provide uh, positive power to row 2 and ground rows 1, 3, and 5, you'd have these three 1, 2, 3 LEDs light up. These displays are very much meant for multiplexing in the same way that uh, these seven segment displays are, right? There's there's no real way to turn on a discrete set of LEDs inside these, even with enough pins. They're wired internally so that you are meant to turn on either one row at a time and ground the columns, or ground one column at a time and turn on whichever rows you want. Either way will work. Um, so you, you basically, you have this grid of LEDs connected between the individual connections of these rows and these columns. And just to make things a little bit more complicated for us, you can see these pin numbers that are indicated up here. Um, those correspond to the physical positions of the pins on the back of your display. Um, you should look up the actual display on the, based on the numbers on the side of it to figure out which pin is which, like where should you start counting. Um, but as you can tell, the connections are not in order, right? So row one is pin nine. Row two is pin 14, row three is pin. So there will be a certain amount of keeping track of that information. We'll need to build that information into our code. So when we say turn on row one, it knows, oh, I, yeah, he actually means turn on pin nine, if that makes sense. So here's one way we could control this LED matrix and don't bake your brain too much over this. I actually didn't spend all that much time in this diagram because it's not what we're gonna do. Um, yeah, I think I've made my feelings pretty clear as to what it would be, but this is sort of the direct analog of what we did last week. Um, we could put a PNP transistor on each of these rows, right, to provide positive voltage uh, to a row of our choosing. And then we could connect an NPN transistor to each of the columns through a current limiting resistor, right, that would limit the current to each of these columns in turn. Those could be connected to their own one, two, three, eight digital pins, right? So eight digital pins on the rows, eight digital pins on the columns. Uh, and then we could do our multiplexing this way, right? We could use this PNP transistor to turn on one row. Then we could use uh, whichever NPN transistors we chose to turn on uh, to ground the other side of the LEDs in that row they were supposed to be on, then move on to the next row, turn its PNP on. This is possible, um, and in fact, it would totally work. Um, if you wanted to build this circuit, it would absolutely function. Um, but the problem is that as we grow this display, right, as we think about, you know, controllability here, this is taking eight plus eight, so 16 pins to control this eight by eight display. These displays can get really chonky. Um, this is a, you know, a relatively small commercial unit. This came out of a, uh, an LED sign like you might see on the side of a bank or a high school or something like that. This is eight by 10. And so already we're talking about eight plus 10 control pins for this or 18 pins. You can imagine if the sign was say, the size of something you would see on the side of the street, you might need hundreds and hundreds of control pins to control something like this. And that's really not particularly feasible um, for any of the microcontrollers that we have on hand. There are microcontrollers that have a huge number of control pins, um, but uh, there are better ways. So this is, this is not the approach that we're going to be taking this evening to control our LED makers. As you, uh, Chris says, poor, poor pins on that LED matrix. Yeah, Chris, Chris, this is another good reason for us to not use this one tonight. As you can see, uh, it's gotten fairly abused in my junk box over time. Um, so rather than doing this, you know, this NPN, PNP, transistor, rows and columns sort of thing, we're going to use, and I might have spoiled it for you earlier, the shift register. Um, these may have come in your introduction to Arduino kit, or they're certainly easy to find. Um, I bought a pack of them uh, on Amazon actually a couple weeks ago, a pack of 25 of these little guys for I think six bucks, even these days. So really, really not hard to come by. Um, they are here. I will look at a picture of them on the screen, but it might be more fun to just look at one in person here. Because I don't think we've used any actual, like, computer chip looking things yet in our adventures, unless I'm wrong. I guess we looked at a transistor that was in a in one of these packages uh, last week, but this will be more fun. So this is an IC, or integrated circuit, um, which just means that there are a bunch of transistors and other passive components built into this ship to do a specific job for us, built by a manufacturer to do a thing. Um, this particular kind of package where you have the rows of pins down each side um, is often a dip package, a dual inline package. I guess it's a it's a dip, a, a dual inline, a dip package would be a dual inline package package, like an ATM machine. It's fine. This is a dip chip. 
Um, they come in all sorts of sizes. This is a pretty typical width. This is three tenths of an inch, which is size such that it will easily go into, I'll steal a breadboard here, will easily go into the pins on a breadboard. And chips like this are actually the reason, getting a little ahead of ourselves, that breadboards have this, uh, this notch down the center. It's so you can plug in one set of pins on one side, so they'll connect to this row of connections, and the other set of pins on the other side, so they'll connect to this row of connections. So this pin is just wide enough, and often when you pull them right out of the pack, you have to sort of squeeze squeeze the pins in a little bit so they're a little bit more vertical and then they will punch right down into punch right down into your breadboard there right so now we can see remember the pins on this side and this side of the canyon in the middle here are not connected to each other um so uh this pin is only connected to this these four exposed uh, holes just here and the pin on the other side is only connected to these four open exposed holes over here so dip chips really easy to uh really easy to prototype with. They also, all of them will have either, let's see if we can see it in the light there, yeah. You see how it has this sort of dot in the upper left-hand corner and this notch right in the center there? So that dot and that notch is actually pretty critical to telling you what the orientation of this thing is. You can think if this didn't have any markings on it, it's like, is this way right side up? Or is that way right side up? And the notch tells you something about orientation. It will look specifically as to where that looks later. A um, Couple quick questions before we get back to the slides. Uh, Palmer says, my 8x8 is mounted on a circuit board with only, ah, VCC ground, DNCS, and clock input. Yes, the, um, your, your display, Palmer, has a, uh, has a chip built into it that allows for, um, some kind of serial control of that display. It'd be worth, if it has a part number on it, it would be worth Googling that part number, um, to see, uh, see if you can learn if it's a, if it's serial or SPI or one of the other, one of the other things that we'll talk about next week. Spoilers. <laughs> Um, the thing we'll talk about this week is this shift register, and specifically tonight we're looking at the 74HC595. Um, it's not the fanciest shift register in the world, it's actually sort of the most basic, um, but that's going to make it the easiest for us to, uh, to understand, so I think it's a great place for us to start. If you Google it, uh, the data sheet will tell you it is a, quote, 8-bit serial in parallel out shift register. Um, so before we get any further, we know some of those words, we can sort of start to tease, a, a tease out what that means, right? So serial, when we think about serial connections between, say, resistors or something like that, or serial communication between an Arduino and a computer, that's things happening one after another, things stacked up in a line. And parallel means things connected side by side, things happening sort of simultaneously or current flowing through multiple paths. So this name is 8-bit serial in parallel out shift register. So we know things are going to be coming in one after another, serial in, and they're going to be coming out side by side. They're going to come out in parallel. Parallel. So that gives us a little clue as to how this is going to work. So this is just a picture of that 16-pin dip format that uh, that we were looking at earlier, just had in our hands, and probably what came with a kit if you've got it. When you look up the data sheet, this is the image, or at least the data sheet that I looked at, this is the image that we got. The, the connections will all be the same. They might have slightly different names. This one shows me, for example, I have this notch here but doesn't show my dot, but I know that this notch is next to pins 1 and 16, and this is a little gotcha. Um, when you're looking at pins on an integrated circuit or on a chip, they will usually count down one side from 1 to, in our case, 8, but could be 1 to 12 or 1 to 16 and then count back up the other side, right? So we go down one to eight, then across from nine up to 16 in our case. So when you're counting out pin numbers, just be careful, they usually go down and then back up. So let's look at uh, how we're going to connect this thing, um, what its connections are and how it works. Um, so let's start by looking at these two pins. Um, on my data sheet, they're called Sir and Sir Clock. Um, I'm going to call them Serial Data Pin and the Serial Clock Pin. And here's how they work. Inside of our shift register, right? Remember, we, we, this was an 8-bit shift register. <laughs> bit shift register <laughs> that the data sheet called it. Um, so somewhere in there, there's a place where this thing is going to remember eight bits of information. And a bit, of course, as we know from a couple weeks ago, a bit is either a zero or a one, an on or an off. So let's say that this gray box represents our shift register. And here's our two points of connection, our serial line and our clock line, our data line and our clock line. And we are going to control by, you know, in, by, at the end of the day, um, telling an Arduino to send a pin high or low, whether we want zero volts to appear there or five volts to appear there, much like we've been doing digital writes and digital reads, right? We're working in a zero to five volt system like we have been for the past few weeks, right? So we're gonna put zero or five volts on, on the serial data line and zero or five volts on the serial clock line. And here's what we're gonna do with them. So 
Ready? Here's the, here's the money part. Here's how a shift register works. When the clock line goes from low to high, that is, it goes from about zero volts to about five volts, because remember, we get a little bit of fudge factor in there. When we go from low to high, this shift register is going to look at what voltage is present on the serial data pin, and it's going to record that value as a zero or one in the first position of the shift register. If we see a zero volts present on the serial data line, we store a zero. If we see five volts present on the serial data line, we store a one. Make sense? So we're not looking at anything. The shift register is just sitting there being dumb until this clock transitions from a low voltage to a high voltage. And at that moment, it says, hey, what's going on with the voltage on my serial data line? I'm gonna store that as either a zero or a one. With me so far? Cool. So when the data line goes from high to low, nothing happens. That's just a way of getting us reset, right? So we went from low to high, we recorded one bit of information. Now we gotta go from high back to low, nothing happens, right? The next time that that serial clock line goes from uh, no change on high to low, the next time we go from low to high, and let's say we have this one stored in here from a previous moment, right? The next time we go from low to high, we are first going to take the information in that first position and roll it over into our second position here. We're going to shift it over, you might say, into this second position. And then we're going to look at the voltage that's present on our data line again, and store that either as a zero or a one in that first position. Zero volts being a zero, one volt being a one. Let's say in this case we saw zero volts this time when we transitioned the clock line from low to high. So we're gonna store a zero there, right? Then we take the clock back from high to low just to reset. And the next time we go from low to high, we again shift everything over one place, look at the data present on the serial line and store that as a zero or a one in that first position. Let's say it's a one this time and so on and so on. So every time that that clock line that goes from low to high, we're going to take one bit of information. We're gonna read that information basically off of the serial data line and store it in the first position, pushing everything else down a position until we get to a situation where we are, you know, we have, we can fill this whole thing up, right? Once we have clocked in, we might say, once we have absorbed eight bits of data, what happens then? Well, let's take a look. When we take that serial clock line from low to high one more time, uh, we will shift everything over one position again, and that last bit of data will just fall out the end, right? We, it doesn't go anywhere, we just lose it. It's, it's dead for all eternity. Um, and then, as usual, of course, we'll look at the voltage on our serial data line, and we will store it as a one or a zero in that first position again, right? So as we continue to shift data in, we will always have the sort of the last eight bits of data that we have shown the device when the clock goes from low to high. Any data that's left at the far end falls out the end and goes nowhere, right? That's the gist of a shift register. Questions? If you've got them, shout them out now. This is a, a sort of the core of what we're working with tonight in terms of hardware. So drop questions in the chat if you have them, because um, this, this is a key concept. Cool? So that's shift registers in a nut well. In a nutwell? In a nutshell? Oh man, I'm gonna take a I'm gonna take a quick quick beer break. Uh, Cause that's that's the core of it. That's the core of shift registers. Chris says, is the max speed the clock can shift based on the register or the Arduino? Um, it just depends on the specific shift register you have. I think in the case of the 74HC595, it's probably limited by the shift register, but let's find out together. So I'll because I'll tell you how to fish instead of what to fish. If I Google 74HC595 datasheet, we'll click on that datasheet PDF here and we'll find out find out for ourselves. Let's see here. I'm gonna look in my absolute maximum ratings. No, that's gonna tell me about voltages and such. Here we go. Uh, input transition rise or fall time. That's not really what I wanna know. Nano amps timing requirements, clock frequency. Here we go. So if we run this thing, I'm gonna zoom in so you can see a little better. If we run this thing at four and a half volts, which is roughly what we are, at room temperature, I can run it at 25 megahertz, right? And the Arduino, we remember from our very first uh, session, runs at 16 megahertz. So even if the Arduino was capable of transitioning its clock every single of its own clock cycles, which it takes a few clock cycles for the Arduino to think of what it has to do next, we still wouldn't be able to keep up with the uh, the frequency of this shift register. So turns out, Chris, in the case of, uh, of this device, the limiting factor is the Arduino and not the shift register. I didn't know that. We learned something today. Super cool. So uh, here's that slide animating itself again with that bit falling out the end. There we go. So 
Um, so we have these bits stored in this shift register, right? But having bits stored somewhere is not actually that useful to us. We want to use this to do some output, to drive one of those LED matrices we were talking about. So how do we get the bits out of the shift register? Here's how. Um, we're going to use this, this other pin here. Um, we're going uh, we're to use these eight other pins, I should say, um, called QA, QB, all the way up to QH. These are our eight outputs. So A is our first output, B is our second output, C is our third output, and so on. You'll often see inputs and outputs labeled by this by letter instead of by number, just so it's harder to get them confused with the pin numbers on the device when you're working with them or talking about them, right? So I have my, my eight outputs here, uh, QA through QH, and I'm going to get the output out of them with the help of this new pin we're going to look at, this R clock pin, or the storage clock pin, you might hear it called, or uh, often the latch pin. And we'll see, uh, we'll see why that is in just a second here. So here's how uh, that latch pin, that R clock pin is going to work. Uh, when the R clock pin, when the latch pin goes from low to high, right? When the latch pin is just sitting there, nothing changes. You know, we can, we can clock data in, we can read data, it can fall at the end. But when that latch pin goes from low to high, we're going to take the bits that we have present in our storage section here and copy them all into this new section of eight bytes uh, called the output register, right? And whatever is in this output register in pink here is going to appear as voltages on our outputs. So I'll say that again. When the latch pin goes from low to high, whatever bits are present in this data section here, right, the bits we've been clocking in all along, when the clock goes from low to high, we're going to copy those bits into our output register. And if the output register in a given position is a 1, we'll see about 5 volts on the output. We'll see a high output. If it's a 0, we'll see 0 volts or about a low output, right? And these 0 and 5 volts work like low and high voltage levels the same way that our low and high levels have worked with Arduino digital pins all along, either for input or output. Makes sense? Uh, Chris asks, QH prime, the reverse of QH? Ah, Chris, you're a little ahead of me. It's a useful pin, but we'll get to it in just a little bit. Um, so, just to give you an example, just to, just to clarify something about how this uh, output register is working, right? So, let's say I've, I've latched my data into my output register. I see 5 volts on QA, I see 0 volts on QB, I see 5 volts on QC, and so on, right? What happens when I clock in the next bit of data, right? When my serial clock goes from low to high, I'm going to look at the voltage present on my serial pin and load it as a bit into this, this storage register here. But I don't automatically see those values on the output here, right? We can see once I've clocked in this bit, the outputs haven't actually updated anything. I have to send my, uh, my R clock or my latch, I have to send that from low to high, and that is what copies my values from this storage register into my output register, right? So I won't see any output on my output pins. I won't, I, they won't change until I take this latch pin from low to high. Make sense? If it doesn't, let's do a physical demo. Let me move a few things out of the way and I will get this guy set up here. So this is on a breadboard, a 74HC595, much like we've just been talking about cook up my power supply here. I'll turn on in just a second, but let's take a qu quick look at what is connected to it. So I have my pins here and I have switches or buttons hooked up to my serial data input here. It's going to have a red LED attached to it. I've attached a little colored cute LEDs to these things so you can see what's turned on and what's turned off. I think that'll just make it a little bit easier to understand what's going on. So I have my serial data line hooked up to this switch here. I have my serial clock line hooked up to this yellow button and this yellow LED. And I have my latch, my R clock hooked up to this green button and this green LED. So turn on my power supply here. And you'll see there's some there's some random data floating around. Like when you boot this thing up, it's not guaranteed to be in any particular state. So right now, this is what's coming out of it. Um, and just to show you that these are actually these LEDs are actually hooked up to these buttons, right? When I turn my switch on over here, I'm turning my serial data line high, so the LED turns on. Turn the switch off, serial data line is low, right? We'll see the serial clock line turn on and off there. When I click that button, and I'll see my latch turn on and off here when I press the green button, right? So let's do a little bench demo, right? Let's clock in some data to this shift register. Um, let's do um, 11001100. So here's how that would work. I would take my serial data line high. I would pulse my clock from low to high once, twice, right? I would turn my serial data line low, pulse my clock from low to high twice, one, two, and we'll repeat. One, two, 
one, two. Now you notice nothing has changed on the output side here. These LEDs, I don't think I mentioned, are hooked directly to the uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight outputs of the shift register uh, through current limiting resistors, I should say. Um, and they're just gonna help us see the output state of uh, the various pins on this shift register. So I just clocked in one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero. So if everything's gone well, when I take my latch pin, my register pin here from low to high, Ooh, looks like I'm missing a couple. Let's see what happened here. Let me clock on a couple more bits. One, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero. Ooh. Interesting. It's also possible that I'm double clutching this switch a little bit. We talked about debouncing switches a couple weeks ago, where sometimes a single physical button press counts as, you know, acts like two button presses. So let's do this one bit at a time, and I'll enable the output each time, and we'll see if we can figure out what's happening. So we'll clock in a one and latch. There's our one. And you'll see that these other bits shifted down one place. We'll clock in another one and enable. Ah, you see? So what happened there is when I thought I pressed the button only once, the actual metal contacts inside of the switch went boom, boom, and bounced a little bit as I pressed the switch. So it got two clock cycles for the price of one. Just a, a, a flaw in physical switches. Um, but you can see as I'm clocking in more bits of data, mostly one at a time, you'll see as I pulse this clock line, and then enable the output, the bits move down the line. So if I keep clocking in zeros, say, clock, latch, clock, latch, clock, latch, clock, latch, clock, latch, eventually we have all zeros. If I have uh, all ones, I clock, latch, clock, latch, clock, latch, clock, latch, and so on, and the bits move down the line. Mostly one at a time, sometimes I get a little double clutch off that button. So that's the gist of a SIF register, right? Whenever you pulse this clock line, you're sucking in one input bit. And then when you have all the bits that you want, whenever you pulse this latch line, you will uh, turn those bits that are stored in the shift register into outputs on those pins. Typically what you would do is clock in a full set of eight bits and then uh, toggle your latch, right? Doing this sort of process where I'm clocking in one bit at a time, and then enabling the outputs would be, I don't know, uh, not a not a bad use for a ship register, but sort of an atypical one. Often, since we have eight outputs to work with, we're going to set those eight outputs to whatever we want them to be, and then we're going to latch them all at the same time into the output pins. Make sense? Questions? Ask the questions if you got them. I'm going to carry on. Um, so Chris asked about this pin earlier that he spotted on our data sheet, the QH prime pin. What the hell is QH prime? Is it the opposite of Q sub H? Is it uh, a duplicate of Q sub H? What's happening here? Um, well, the QH prime pin is our, we can think of that as our serial out pin. That pin is an output that is always connected to the last bit of data in our shift register. So if the last bit of data in our shift register is a one, we have five volts present on that QH prime, that output pin. If we have, oh, you can't see that. Hang on. Let's, uh, there we go. Um, if we have a one in the last place in our storage register here, we have five volts on the output. If we have a zero in the last place in our storage register, we have uh, uh, zero volts on the output. And it's important to note that this is referencing not the output register here like QH, but the actual storage register here. It's, it's looking at the bits in storage, whether or not we've latched them to the output or not. Um, so why is that cool? Well, what if we had more than one shift register? We could connect them together like so. We could connect the QH prime, the serial output from one shift register to the serial input of the next shift register. What would that do for us? Well, um, let's uh, go with me here for a second. I'll show you why that's useful. So in this state, right, we have uh, a one in the final position of our first shift register, which means we have five volts present on uh, this purple wire here uh, between the serial output of this shift register up here and the serial input of the shift register down here. Um, so if we were to connect the two clock lines together and connect them to a switch and then sent that, that line from low to high, what would happen? Well, the second shift register is going to see the five volts coming in on its serial input line and record a one. And the serial input of our first shift register is going to look at whatever voltage we've chosen to put on it in this case. Let's say it's five volts, it records a one there. Basically what we've done is we've taken the one from the end of this first shift register and we've moved it into the first position of the second shift register. So by connecting the serial output of one shift register to the serial input of the next, we're able to daisy chain these things together and essentially double the length of our, uh, of our storage bus here, right? Our storage information went from eight bits with a single shift register to 
16 bits with two shift registers. How do we make use of the uh, the bit in that second shift register? Well, it turns out we can also, if my display will update here, we can also tie our latch pins together, but in this case with this green wire. When we take that from low to high, it's going to latch all of the bits in both shift registers uh, to, into their outputs, right? So I've taken my storage bus in my first shift register here and latched it to the output. I've taken the eight bits in my second shift register here and latched them to the output. So for the cost of no additional output controls, right? No additional buttons or switches or pins in our Arduino. I now have eight, I now have uh, 16 outputs instead of eight. How cool is that? Um, so that's the function of this QH pin. Um, and for our purposes, we've been doing this with, uh, with physical switches, but I just wanna show you real quick and we'll do this in just a little bit. You could do the same thing with digital Arduino pins. We could have a digital pin driving the serial control of this first shift register, and then a pin controlling the clock simultaneously of both and the latch simultaneously of both. And for the cost of those three pins, we now have 16 outputs. It's not a coincidence that we had need 16 outputs for this uh, pair of shift registers and that that LED matrix we were looking at earlier needs 16 outputs to control it. We're gonna make use of that in a little bit. So to show you how this, uh, this chaining happens in real life, let's do demo number two. So as I teased earlier, I have a second shift register set up here. So I've got this other breadboard and I've got eight more outputs present here. And I've actually, I've tied these red, green, uh, red, green, and yellow LEDs to the same signals that are controlling these ones. So when I see my, my serial line go high, I'm gonna see uh, this red LED turn on. When I have my latch turn on, I have this green LED. And when I have my serial clock pulse, I'm gonna have this yellow LED. So I'm gonna hook them up by the same way that we uh, hooked them up in our diagram here just a moment ago. So my serial data line, this red wire here, needs to be connected to the QH pin, which is Q pin nine on my breadboard there. And then my serial clock and my, my latch pins can be connected uh, in parallel with the existing connections. So that's my existing pin. It's got my, I think I'm gonna connect it over here straight to where that LED is connected. Connect that there. Boop. And just go in there. All right, and that connects to that point on the breadboard there with that yellow LED. So those two points are connected together. And then green to green. Oops, I've broken my wire here. Grab my wire strippers. We'll strip that back off. There we go. Connect green on that side to green on this side. All the prep in the world and sometimes wires just break. I'm also going to need to connect the ground and the uh, the power to this second breadboard. And there we go. You see we got power again. We have random bits that have been sort of floating around in here. Um, that the, the state is undefined when you power these up. So um, you can't count on it to be anything in particular. Um, so let's do, a, we'll do a quick demo with these both the shift registers set up in serial like this. And then we'll look at a few questions. So um, let us first... Uh, let us clear everything out. I'm going to clock 16 zeros into the device, uh, and then I'm going to latch those zeros in. So I've set my serial input on this first shift register to zero. I'm going to clock in one, two, three, four. And you'll see when I'm pulsing the serial clock line, it's connected directly to both of these shift registers, right? I think that's 16-ish. We'll do a few more. There we go. Now, when I latch all those zeros in, everything turns off. And you'll notice that once again, the latch line is kind of directly to both of the shift registers. Only the serial line, uh, the serial in goes into the first shift register and then out. The serial clock is connected directly to uh, both shift registers at the same time. Ooh, I've stolen a bit off my button there. All right, so let's uh, let's clock in a single one bit and we'll watch it travel between the two devices. So set my serial line high, my clock goes from low to high and I'm gonna enable my output. And then I'm here, I'm gonna clock in more zeros. Clock in a zero, output. Clock in a zero, output. Zero, output. Zero, output, and so on. And when that one reaches the end of the first shift register, you'll see that even though, you'll see that now I've got a, uh, a one for my final output here, and that my next shift register is seeing a one present on its serial input. So the next time I pulse this clock pin and enable the output, that one has jumped from one shift register to the next. And as I continue 
to pulse my clock line and uh, and latch those bits in, we see that that bit is moving continuously down the shift register. There's no reason, by the way, you have to do this with only two shift registers. Um, you could do this with dozens if you wanted to, or hundreds. Although once you get to hundreds, there might be uh, chips out there that might make your life a little bit easier. Um, but that is the gist of attaching shift registers together in series. You connect your clock and your latch pin uh, to all of your shift registers, and then the serial data comes into one register and then out of that QH prime, that serial out pin, and into the next one. Cool. So let's do, let's take a quick peek at questions. Then we have a few more things to talk about with these. Let's see. Michael says, my kit only came with one shift register. I haven't dug into how tutorials, how it would be controlled. It'd be possible with just one shift register. Yeah, Michael, it certainly would be possible to do everything we're doing today with just one shift register. You could make use of a shift register and eight digital pins, right? If we, if we need 16 outputs, we do a shift register for eight of those pins and eight digital outputs for the other eight. Um, they might need uh, transistors on those eight digital pins, depending on how much power you're pushing out, but that's totally doable. Ah, Kenneth's got it. Yeah, you need eight plus three instead of just three, um, but still totally doable. And if you want to play around with these, like I say, these are cheap and I use them for all kinds of fun things. Um, so that's that's the gist of how we're going to get our 16 outputs. We're going to connect our shift registers just like this, um, and we're going to use them to sort of clock some data into them, and then we're going to latch it in and use those as our outputs. There's a couple of uh, implementation details that I want to make sure I, I clarify. Um, because I've done them here and I haven't talked about them yet. So I want to make sure if you're playing around with this, and I encourage you to, here's a couple more things you need to know. There's a few pins we haven't talked about yet. Um, this OE pin, pin 13, is the output enable pin. And you see it's got this line over it, this over bar, we call that, which means that it is uh, what they call active low. We're normally, you know, we, we usually think of something as being active high. In fact, when we talk about like um, an Arduino pin being on, we usually mean it's at five volts. High is on. In this case, is this over bar, this, um, this not symbol, means that this pin is active low. And in this case, if you read the data sheet, um, you have to pull the OE pin low in order for the outputs to be active. If you pull the OE pin high, uh, the outputs don't turn on. They're disconnected from everything. It's neither high nor low. It's like you unplug the wire from them. So that may be a useful functionality to be able to turn on or off for your application. In my case, I have just pulled that pin low permanently. So the outputs are always on. Um, we also have this SR clear, this serial register clear pin, also with an over bar, so we know it's active low. When you pull the register clear pin low, you clear out all eight bits in that register, right? So the ability to clear, you know, uh, if you wanted to connect these all together, uh, all of your shift registers together to the same clear line, you could set them all to zero at once. Again, that may be useful for your application. It's not something I'm using. So to make sure I don't do that, I've tied the SR clear line high to five volts uh, in both of my shift registers here. Just to show you that visually on our, our diagram we've been using, the OE pin I've tied to low, so I always enable the outputs, and the, uh, the SR clear, the serial clear line I've tied to high, so I'm never clearing my outputs. You can see that actually on my breadboard here. I've just used... Uh, I've just used these little bits of wire to tie. I think that one is the, that must be the SR clear. It's pulled high with that little red wire going to my power bus here. And that little white wire is going to my output enable. It's tied low, so it's always outputting. Um, and then the last couple pins to mention, just because we haven't already, um, we have those to this VCC pin and this ground pin. The ground pin, you've probably guessed, is ground. VCC means the power supply pin. So in our case, that's five volts. And again, I just use a couple little bits of wire. I've got this little orange wire here, tying it to my power supply here to connect to five volts. And I've got a little sneaky wire under my labels here, connecting the ground pin to ground. So make sure you hook up your ground and five volt pins or your circuit won't work, or at least it probably won't, especially if you're hooking it up to an Arduino. Depending on how the circuitry inside these chips works, it's sometimes possible to power them through an input pin. It's not really something you want to do, but there are cases where you can leave that VCC pin disconnected and still see, say, outputs turning on or pins lighting up. You really should just connect your power pin. That's best practice. Questions? <laughs> There's like just enough latency that I don't feel good asking for questions. Like I'd have to take a very long sip of beer and we'd be through this beer so fast in this night that uh, I don't think it's it's worth actually waiting every single time. But I'll keep priming you for it because um, I think it's it's a, a good time to do. Chris says the power rails on each side of the breadboard are tied together. Ah, Chris, great question. No, they are not. Um, 
you'll see. So I've got these on both of these. I have this red and blue rail here and this red and blue rail here. I've actually jumpered together the two sides where I need them to be connected. So I have this white wire on this one and I have this sneaky white wire on this one connected to both my grounds. It turned out in both of these situations, I didn't need uh, any power on this side of my breadboard. So I didn't jumper the power between the two. But you'll see when we get into later examples, we have more breadboards. You just spend some wire to jumper the connections between breadboards where you need the power and ground to be the same. So no, by default, they are not connected together. Good question. Um, let's do, keep keep the questions coming, but I'm gonna, while we're talking about them, here's VCC and ground, I'm gonna set up the demo to do the same thing we've just been doing, but we're gonna do it with an Arduino. And that's gonna move us into the coding portion of tonight. So I'm gonna look at the table for a second here. I'm gonna turn my power supply off. I'm gonna bring my Arduino in, zoom out just a little bit. There we go. So from my Arduino, I have uh, four wires that I'm going to need to hook up to this circuit that are going to correspond to serial, uh, serial clock, and my latch pin here. And I also need to tie this Arduino into a common ground. This is the thing that we harped on a lot last week is uh, the need to make sure that everything is sharing the same ground reference. Um, so the circuits have a, a sort of a complete flow of current, right? So the current makes a full loop. Um, so much like before, I'm going to tie this yellow wire into my yellow input there. That's gonna be my serial clock. I'm gonna plug my red wire in to do what this switch is doing here. I'm basically going to, I'm gonna leave my switches in place, but I'm basically, instead of pushing the switches with my physical finger like a caveman, I'm gonna use our microcontroller to, uh, to drive those inputs instead. I'm gonna pick up my green wire here where my green is connected. If I have room, I do. Oh, you get to see top of my head cam for the first time tonight, probably not the last. Very exciting. Let's see here. All right, so there's our arch. Oops, my yellow wire slipped out here. Boop. So there's our Arduino set up. Make sure my Arduino is plugged into the computer will always help. And if you want to play along at home, um, I should have mentioned the top of the uh, top of the stream. There are code for all that we're doing tonight, and there is a lot of code it is available on the, my website. Uh, down. I'll get it right this time. I swear. Oops, let's see here. There we go, <laughs> down here uh, at jeff.glash slash electronics bash. If you go to that website, you'll find all of the slides that we're looking at tonight. So you don't have to memorize any of these pin definitions. You'll also find all the code that we're playing with tonight, at least everything that we don't think to write live. So um, especially tonight, I encourage you to go and look at that code um, as we play with it, because there's going to be a lot of it. So first, we're going to look at this uh, this shift basic demo from uh, from that bit of code. And I'll show you what that is. So uh, to get data into a shift register is kind of a repetitive process as we saw. We need to uh, set our serial data line either high or low and then pulse the clock from low to high and then take it back to low again to reset it. And then we set up our next bit of data as either high or low and then take the clock from low to high and then high to low again. It would be awfully convenient if we could write a function that would sort of take a bunch of this data and then set up the data, run the clock, set up the data, run the clock, etc. It turns out this is a common enough function that the uh, Arduino language has this ability built in. Um, it is the shift out function um, that we'll look at in just a second here. Let me zoom you in just a little bit. Um, so to get that set up, right, we have our three points of connection for our clock pin, our data pin, and our latch pin. For me, I've hooked them up to uh, digital outputs 10, 11, and 12. I've told them all to be outputs using this pin mode function that we should know so well by now. And now I'm going to make use of our shift out function here, which takes four variables. It takes the pin that you want to output your data on, the pin that you want to output your clock on, your bit order, which we'll get to in a second here, uh, and the actual information, the value that you want to output. So to get set up to use the shift out function um, we want to make sure first that our latch pin is low so that when we're later when we're ready to output our data we'll take it high right so we'll prep by setting it low um, then we'll make sure that our clock pin is low so that once uh, once our data starts flowing in we're ready to take it from low to high when we're ready and then we'll use our shift out function so you might guess our data pin and clock pin are going to be our data pin and our clock pin respectively this LSB first is gonna be what I'm gonna use for our bit order value here. LSB stands for least significant bit. And what this means is that when I take my data here, which in this case, I've written in binary form, so it's in ones and zeros, because that's how the output's gonna appear on the far end anyway. So I have this data 11110000. If I use this LSB first for my bit order, the information I'm going to get at the far end, this zero, this least significant bit, the farthest to the right bit is gonna come out first. 
and then this zero, and then this zero, and then this zero, and then one, 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 right? So when, when I do this, when I run this shift out command, uh, I'm going to shift out all eight bits of this data, right? The Arduino is going to set the data pin uh, to zero for me and then pulse my clock pin and then set it to zero again and then pulse my clock pin and so on and so on until it's output all eight bits of this data. The shift out function takes a byte of data. So you have to output eight bytes every time that you use this particular function. There's no reason you couldn't write your own code to output say five bits at a time or 12 bits at a time, but the shift out function that's built in takes exactly eight bits every time. Um, when we wanna output more bits than that at once, we'll be, uh, we'll be building a little function of our own that we'll get to in just a second here. So once we've written all that data out, we do have to take the latch pin high ourselves to make those, uh, take that data that's in the storage register and get it to output. So let's look at what should happen here when I run this code. Uh, I'm going to shift out uh, least significant bit first, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, latch that data in, wait one second using our delay function here. I'm going to wait a thousand milliseconds. And then we're going to repeat the process, right? I'm going to make sure my latch pin is low, take my clock pin low. Then I'm going to shift out the opposite of that, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then latch that data in and then wait a second and then repeat. So this is the shift basic example that's on the website if you're following along at home. And after I confirm that I have the correct port selected, which I don't think I do. Let's see here. Oops. COM3 is showing up. COM3 is my, um, my tally lights controller that's controlling the little lights that are above my cameras. For some reason, I'm not seeing, oh, this, USB cable was not particularly plugged in. Let's see, there we go. COM5 is gonna be my circuit here. Let's upload that. Come back to the table here. And once that finishes uploading, we should see, yeah, there we go. Here, maybe I will adjust the lighting a little bit in here so you can see a little bit better what's happening. So what is happening here? So the Arduino obviously is pulsing data in once a second, um, but we have two shift registers here hooked up. We have a first one and a second one. And something strange is happening. Something is shorting and I can tell, oh, <laughs> my power supply wasn't on. So all this was trying to be powered through the Arduino, um, which obviously wasn't working. And I don't have the five volt line from the Arduino hooked up to anything, which means that this was uh, this was trying to power everything through those input pins, as I mentioned. So that's no good at all. So now that things are, are back in ship shape order, we can see that we're clocking in 11110000 and then latching that information in and then clocking in the reverse of that and latching that in. And of course, those values are carrying over, right? They're passing through to our other shift register here. So when when this one has its first, it's, uh, it's eight new bits clocked in, those eight previous bits are ending up in this shift register. And that's why they're appearing in alternation. I'm just getting the alternating set of eight bits one time and then the other. Ken says a good demo of why you really have to connect VCC. Yeah, it was totally, totally purposeful. That's a, that's a totally deliberate demo of uh, what happens when you don't connect things. Whoops. I hope you can learn from my mistakes. That's sort of, I guess, the whole goal of what, uh, what we're doing here on these Sunday nights. Um, so to come back to our code for a second here, um, something you might already have noticed is that uh, this bit of code, set the latch, latch pin low, set the clock pin low, then shift things out, then set the latch pin high. This is, you know, this we've done the same thing here as we have down here. We got the same four lines of code. And uh, like always, when we have lines of code repeating themselves, it would be a good idea to encapsulate them into a function. So let's do that. Um, this will be our second code example of tonight. This will be the shift function. Uh, demo from the website if you're following along. You'll see it looks very similar to the one we just did. We have our clock data and latch pin defined. We have our, our pins defined as outputs here. But then I've written this function called send byte out that will look very similar. It's the four lines we were just working with. We set the latch pin low, we set the clock pin low, we shift our data out, and we latch the data in, right? And by encapsulating this in a function that we wrote ourselves that takes a, a byte in that I've called value here by feeding it a byte, feeding it a byte, I should say, um, now our loop is a lot more comprehensible, right? I can see, oh, I'm clocking out a, a byte that looks like this, and I'm clocking out a byte that looks like that, and I'm waiting a second in between. By taking some of this sort of noisy, repetitive operations out into their own function, I now have a, a much cleaner thing to understand what's happening here. So I'll upload this to the thing, uh, to the Arduino itself. If all has gone well, it should look exactly the same as it does now. Yeah, nothing looks like it has changed. So we're doing exactly the same thing. We just encapsulated that um, that code into a function. <laughs> you have to drink every time you forget to turn on your power supply. Oof, I don't know that this tall boy is going to get me through enough of the night for that to be possible. But it's not a bad plan. 
you, you at home can play the uh, the Jeff Glass <laughs> programs live on stream drinking game uh, with whatever rules you choose to. Or whether you're playing with water, that's also fine too. You'll end up very hydrated. Um, so one more um, one more thing to talk about with this shift out function before we dive into the basics of building our output for our, our LED matrix is I said that this shift out function takes uh, takes a byte, takes eight bits. And as I hinted at earlier, that LED matrix is going to need 16 outputs to drive it. So we could write a function that takes two bytes and shifts them out separately, but there's actually a slightly cleaner way to handle this. Um, and this will be our shift int example from the website if you're following along at home. Um, so a byte is eight bits, eight individual ones and zeros. An integer, an int, the, the numbers, the basic numbers we've been working with since week one of this series um, are 16 bits long. They hold up to 16 ones and zeros. Though we're not usually thinking of them as ones and zeros, right? We're using them as integers, as numbers to count or hold things or sum things up. Uh, but you can write directly to the bits uh, of an integer. Um, and the way that you the the way that I think is clearest to craft an integer out of uh, out of bits is like so. Um, the low the the a, a byte of information eight bits of information holds a value between zero and two hundred and fifty five. So if we multiply our our second byte by two hundred and fifty six, we know that its value will be larger than the largest possible value of a single byte. Um, so in other words, this uh, this structure here where I have um, a byte of information times 256 plus a byte of information means that I'm storing the ones and zeros of this byte uh, next to the ones and zeros of this byte. You might think of this as the low byte, the small byte, the byte that is itself not multiplied by anything. And this byte is going to be what we call the high byte of our integer. It's the byte that has been multiplied by 256 times. It, it, it occupies the higher level digits places of our integer, if you want to think of it. Um, this, um, these bytes right here, just to spell it out explicitly. Um, so I have my one zero, one zero, one zero, one zero. If I could write an integer using ones and zeros, this would be equal to one zero, 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 right? That is equal to this, uh, this math that we've done just here. Unfortunately, uh, you can't in Arduino, I think, uh, kind of tell me if I'm wrong, you can't say, you know, int number equals this long, long binary string. I don't think it will let you. Uh, let's find out, actually. <laughs> let's see, uh, let's learn something live together again tonight. Let's see if this will compile. Yeah, I didn't think so. So it will only let you declare uh, eight bit uh, numbers, eight bit bytes in this way with this binary field. So to make a longer number out of bits, you have to use this construction where you multiply one of them by 256, right? So you notice I'm using this send int out function that we haven't talked about yet. It's a function I, I also wrote and its construction will not surprise you terribly much, right? Um, all we're going to do is take our clock and latch pins low like we were before. We're going to shift out one byte of data and we're going to shift out the other byte of data. And only after both bytes, after all 16 bits have been sent out to the shift register, then we'll pull the latch pin high and enable everything, right? And the order in which we're going to shift them out, we're going to send that low byte out first, right? This secondary value is going to come out first in LSB first order, right? So it's going to come out this zero, then this one, then this zero, then this one, and so on. And once all eight of those are out, then we'll start to see this zero and this one and this zero and this one and so on. So I've got a couple different selections of bytes here. So when I upload this code, we'll take a look at it. Kind of clarifies, yeah, Arduino binary header only says one to eight bits. So you could do shorter numbers, but you can't do any more than eight bits um, with that uh, that B and then ones and zeros construction there. So now we have the Arduino outputting a 16 bits of information and then latching them all in at once. We have this sort of like alternating pattern and then we have this four and four pattern here. So the Arduino is clocking out 16 bits of information, then latching that in, then clocking out 16 bits of information and latching that in. That's the gist of that, that send int out command. And again, you could write your own code that clocks out uh, 20 bits or 24 bits, maybe three bytes of information or you know, 48 bytes of information if you had six of these shift registers. I'm going to need two of them. So I have written a function that outputs 16 bits at once. And I find that storing 16 bits in an integer like that is a really handy way to do it. Kenneth clarifies, oh, getting comfortable with hexadecimal can be nice. So hexadecimal is a way of writing numbers um, using 
uh, the letters, uh, the digits 0 through 9 and the letters A through F to represent values 0 through 16. And that lets you condense, as Kenneth says, a string of numbers like 11110000 into F0. Um, look up hexadecimal to binary conversion on the web if you're interested in digging into that more, because uh, it can be a really handy way to condense, uh, condense some of this information to make it a little bit more readable. Because tonight we're going to be working directly with ones and zeros on outputs, I'm going to leave everything in binary form. But Kenneth's right, especially as you get into larger number of these outputs, you should uh, check out working in hex as well. So that is the gist of shifting out 16 bits of information from a shift register. Um, and just to, just to recap, this is the, uh, the way that everything is connected right now. So I have my, my uh, serial output pin from my Arduino connected to my serial line here. I have my clock pin on my Arduino connected to the clock of both of the shift registers in parallel. I have my latch pin on my Arduino connected to both of the latch pins, these R clock pins, on the shift registers in parallel. And I have the serial output from the first shift register connected to the input of the second shift register. Woof. <laughs> But the benefit of all this, right, is that uh, though it's a mouthful for me to say out loud, um, you can start chaining these things together. And now we have 16 outputs for the price of three pins on the Arduino, which is pretty freaking cool. Um, so let's, uh, let's dive back to where we started, which was controlling one of these LED matrices. Um, so this is the um, the pinout of the specific LED matrix that I'm going to be working with tonight. Um, you'll see that the uh, there's 64 LEDs, 8 times 8, and uh, the anodes, the positive side, are connected to these columns, and the cathodes, the ground side, is connected to these rows. Um, I will probably mess that up back and forth at some point tonight, but um, we can always refer back to this slide if I've gotten it wrong. Um, and uh, these numbers here tell me which pins on the, uh, on the bottom of my LED matrix are um, are connected to which of these rows. And you know, I'll show you my chance unplugging this, but I hope I can get it plugged back in. Um, when I Googled, you can see this says 1088AS. It told me that the pin underneath this corner, if the writing is here, the pin underneath this corner is pin one. And then I count across one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then it didn't tell me this. It just told me I had pin one here. But like I said before, pins are usually one through eight. And then I jump to the pins that are up here to go nine through 16. So flipping that over, right, I have pins one through eight on one side. Then I jump across to the other side, pins nine through 16. Um, so that was something that I pulled from the data sheet for my particular display. Your display may have a slightly different pinout. So worth, uh, worth looking it up if you can. Let's get this demo out of the way here. because so we may bring it back later, but uh, I think we can set it aside for now and focus on our moneymaker which will be our LED matrix for tonight. So this is how I have the LED matrix wired up. Let's get rid of that. Um, do, <laughs> don't get, uh, don't worry too much about getting too deep into this. Um, uh, you can find this circuit is on the website, it's in the slides, um, but I will, I will describe it for you now in as much detail as we need. We have our two shift registers hooked up just as before. I have a single pin driving the, uh, the serial clock and latch of the shift registers. The serial goes into one pin of the first shift register and then uh, comes out of the serial out into the second. Latch and uh, clock are connected in parallel here. And then my eight outputs uh, from each shift register are hooked up to the, uh, the eight row pins and the eight column pins uh, of my matrix. And I made a choice at this point about how to hook these up. I said that uh, bit one, uh, which in my case is going to be the last bit of the sh second shift register, is going to be connected to pin one uh, of my LED matrix. And then my, my last bit on my uh, LED matrix is going to be connected, my second to last bit connects to pin two, and my third to last bit connects to pin three, and so on. I could also have hooked these up so that the last bit was, say, column eight, and the second to last bit was column seven, and then column six. Either way, you're going to have to do some level of translation, right, because the rows and columns don't, are not in order with the pin numbers, so I chose to have my shift register pins and my LED matrix pins match up, and then I knew I was going to have to map my columns and rows to that same bit order. And we'll, we'll look at that in code in a little bit, but just know if you're hooking this up yourself and using my code, that's the assumption that I'm making is that the shift register pins match the LED matrix pins. Um, I've also hooked up four buttons to pins six, seven, eight, and nine uh, between those pins and ground. So we're gonna, you might be able to guess, we're gonna use them uh, with that input pull-up type that we've been using so much before. So those pins will be high when the buttons are not being pressed. When we press those buttons, those pins will be pulled low to ground. And that's the gist of the hardware setup. So let's, let's take a peek at it on the table here. 
you can zoom in a little bit, you can see all the bits and pieces. So um, as I did last week, I'm making use of this Arduino Pro Mini instead of uh, instead of the Uno that we've been using so far tonight. Uh, the programming is exactly the same. The pin connections are exactly the same. Um, the only difference is this one plugs directly into a breadboard, which for a demo that I'm gonna be waving about all night, is just a little bit more reliable for me to work with. Um, but this code will work exactly the same whether you hook it up with a Pro Mini uh, or whether you hook it up with, with wires with an, Ar with a, an Arduino Uno. So either way you're working is just fine. You can see up here, I've got my two shift registers and they're connected by these 16 wires to uh to my led matrix here so if we look i got a little pointer here if we look uh output q sub a here my first output on the second shift register is this red wire comes around and connects to pin one under here then my second output here comes around and is connected to pin two under here then my third output comes through this white wire through a current limiting resistor to pin three so i made a second choice here that i want to call out which is that my uh, my columns of my LED matrix have current limiting resistors on them, and my rows do not. And what that's going to mean is that I can uh, I can only I only want to turn on one row at a time um, because I only have one current limiting resistor for each position in that row. So I might say enable one row and then turn on through their individual current limiting resistors the leds those columns in that row that i want to turn on then i'll turn on the next row and i'll turn on the individual leds and then the next row and then turn on the individual columns um, i could also have chosen to put the current limiting resistors on the rows instead of the columns i chose to do it with columns either way is fine um so that is the the gist of how things are hooked up. And so now I want to show you how we're going to start driving it. And this is the point in the evening when we're really going to start diving into some code. Um, I'm going to do my best to remember to call out which example on the website we're on if we're following along either live or after the fact. Um, I also want to sort of reinforce that tonight is not necessarily about um, building, uh, learning how to build this one specific game. The game we're going to be building tonight is the game of Snake which you may have played before, um, with a little 2D line that crawls around the screen, eating bits of food or prey, and when it crashes into itself, you lose, right? It's a relatively straightforward game. But the point tonight is not to learn how to write the game Snake. The point is to try and dig into some of the ways in which we can allow our program to do multiple things at once. So I, there's going to be a lot of things tonight flying past us. And uh, at some point tonight, you might think to yourself, I... I didn't understand how that worked or how those bits or how those bytes, I, I, don't, I don't quite get it. What I want you to take away from tonight is sort of the general practices. So don't be too worried if not every single concept sticks um, because uh, tonight's, tonight's about themes and not about specifics. We're just gonna use specifics to get there. So um, now that we have our, our circuit set up, let me show you uh, the first bit of code uh, that's gonna start getting us on the place to control this LED matrix. This is going to be example A from our uh, oops, from our website tonight. This is gonna be, what did I call it? The pins example. It's just gonna be the basic connections we've worked with so far, and it's gonna look very similar. So I have my clock pin connected to pin 10, data's on 11 and latch is on 12. I'm gonna set them up as outputs, just like, uh, just like I did previously. This should all look very familiar. Um, and I'm, I've actually just copied and pasted this send integer to display function that we had earlier. It's going to send 16 bits of information out to those shift registers. So actually, to start things off, there's no new code in this example. We've already looked at it. Um, but I've put in a few comments here um, as a way to start thinking about how we might start to build that code. Um, this is uh, an exercise that programmers sometimes call writing pseudocode, right? It's to write out in language, in English, what your code is going to do or what parts of it are going to do, and then basically start turning that English into code. Um, the same way that you might say, um, <laughs> something that I did this week, um, I, said, I baked a loaf of bread this week, right? Well, to bake a loaf of bread, I mean, I, I know what that means, you know what that means, but uh, if I was gonna break that down into instructions that a computer could understand, I might have to tell it first to, um, to mix certain ingredients in a bowl, turn the oven on, wait for a certain amount of time for the oven to get hot, which you might call a joint operation called preheating, put the dough in a pan or on a sheet, place in the oven, wait a certain amount of time, take bread out of the oven, right? There'd be a certain number of steps that we'd have to fulfill. And if we were gonna get down to the really granular level, like, you know, when we're communicating very specific details, like we do in code, right? We, we have to tell it which specific pins are on or off at any specific moment. I might have to tell the, com the computer, you know, to, to put the bread 
bread in the oven means to open the door of the oven, insert the uh, the pan with the dough on it into a place in the oven that has a rack immediately beneath it, release your hand from the pan, then close the door. You might have to get super, super granular. Um, but English is sort of the highest level we can think of things at, and so writing things out in English, or in whatever language you might speak, um, can be a really easy way to start thinking about the structure of your code. So this is the pseudocode that I've sort of put together for our game, and I think it's actually a really decent way to think about a basic structure for a lot of real-time applications. It's going to have essentially three separate uh, phases to it. Um, that are as follows. Uh, I'm going to check my inputs. Uh, in my case, have any buttons been pressed or uh, switches or things? Uh, I'm going to store some results of what's happened with the inputs in some variables. Then I'm going to uh, do some, I'm going to check the state of my game, which might be, in our case, accepting time as an input. Um, and uh, if I if I need to, to change something, if enough time has passed, um, and based on the, the information I've gotten from checking my inputs, I might have to sort of update my internal state, update my internal sense of what things should look like on my display. And then I'm going to need to check and make sure that my, dis see if my display itself needs updating. And as we know from our multiplexing example last week, we're going to need to be cycling through the various outputs that we have, the various rows of our matrix or the various digits of our four digit display pretty quickly. So I'm going to be wanting checking very, very quickly to see, you know, hey, is it time for that next digit? Is it time for that next row? So these are going to be sort of the three separate phases um, that I'm going to loop through. And it's important to remember, right, I don't want to use any, don't want to do, don't want to do anything in any of these three phases that's going to lock us up. I don't want to use that delay function. I don't want to use any waiting. Uh, I just want to get through these phases sort of as fast as I can. So often I'm going to move through this loop, right, because the loop runs forever. I'm going to come in and I'm going to check my inputs. Any buttons pressed? Uh, no. Check the game state. Does anything need to change? Well, it hasn't been enough time and nobody pressed any buttons, so no change. Hey, do we need to update the display? More often, uh, more often not, but often yes. So to change which row or which digit we're displaying. And then we're going to loop back to the top, check the buttons, check the game state, check the display. And so we're going to sort of move through these three, three steps very, very quickly, you know, thousands or millions of times a second. And that's going to be the overall structure of our program. So as a place to start, I've actually written three functions here, check input, check game state, and, ch and uh, display update. Um, and this is going to be the structure of our code. It's going to run the display input function. It's going to display the check game state function and it's going to uh, run the display update function. It's gonna run those over and over and over and over again. Right now, of course, in this version of the code, they don't do anything, but we will <laughs> we'll be putting code into them to make them do things. Um, and uh, that's gonna be sort of the structure of things. Does that sort of make sense? Do you have the bench camera when you talk through the code? Oh, Cal Palmer, I totally can. I think this view is gonna be better for you, yeah? Very good. Um, so, um, let's start with, so when I'm thinking about where to start here, because it, it sort of seems like I could start by looking at buttons, I could start building some state, I could start building a display. Um, here's the general way that I think about it. I want to sort of build a minimum viable um, concept here. I want to sort of like get to the point where um, sort of like I want to I want to see something on the display something happening. Um, and then I can get fancy with rules and control and things like that. But let's get us to a very basic level of things just showing up um, on our display. Um, so as a place to start, let's jump to our second example of the evening. This will be example B. I, and I gave them letters because I was sure I, I wasn't going to be able to uh, remember the order that they came in. Um, this will be our display constants example from the website if you're following along. Um, so uh, this, you know, the, the code in general, this is every bit of code that we look at tonight is going to be an addition to the one we had before. So I've, I've copied everything over and we've added some code into it and we'll try and talk through all the bits of it that have changed. So it's going to have the same, you can assume it has the same pin connections. These are all still outputs and so on. But here's the bit that I've added for this next example, right? I said earlier that I was going to need to do some translation between which bit of this shift register controlled which part of the display. And this is how I'm storing that. So um, this is uh, this int row zero, int row one, etc. tells me, or I, I've told it that row zero of my display is connected to bit nine of my shift registers. Row one of my display is connected to bit fourteen of the shift registers. So say that another way, I know that row zero of my display is connected to bit nine. As I said earlier, bit nine for me is also pin nine. So pin nine of my display here 
is connected to this bit here, which is the ninth bit that's going to come out of my Arduino. Row one is in pin 14. This red wire here is connected through to the 14th bit that's going to come out of my Arduino and so on. So this is, this is the point in the code where I'm telling it which of those bits on that shift register are connected to which, um, which row connections or column connections on the matrix. If you wire up your shift registers differently, this will be the part of the code that you'll need to change. Um, so I've done, this, I've done this here with rows. I've created this variable here called numRows just to, as a, a counter for how many rows that I have. And if your LED matrix has a different number of rows than mine, you'll need to change this as well. Um, and then I've created, a, uh, created an array here uh, to hold the value of all those row information uh, as well in order. Um, just as that'll be a little bit easier to reference this data later. And you'll see that I have this row zero information here is in position zero in my array, because you'll recall that positions within arrays start counting from zero instead of counting from one. So this is value zero in this array. This is value one, this is value two. And you'll notice they're row zero, row one, row two, which is awfully handy and not a coincidence. Um, and then we'll do the same exact thing with columns, right? This tells me that uh, where where is uh, where is column zero of the LED matrix attached? Oh, it's attached to bit 13 in my shift register. Where is column one attached? It's attached to bit three in the shift register and so on. And similarly, I have this variable that is the number of columns and I've stored them all in an array down here, right? Um, so that's sort of the hardware interface level where I've told it which bits of my shift register are connected to which columns. But how am I, so, so I, I have a way of sort of telling the Arduino where my, uh, where my bits are going to connect to the uh, shift registers itself. Um, and now I'm, I'm going to need to start thinking about some way to represent the data that I'm going to show on that display. And I think a natural way for a 2D display to, to hold that data is this, which is a two dimensional array. So we mostly have been working with one dimensional arrays so far, like we have down here. We've, we've seen this construction a couple times now. We have int numbers with a bracket, and then inside curly brackets, we have a, a, a list basically of numbers that we could reference. Um, and then you know later when we need to reference one of these numbers, I could say, I'm going to reference number in position four. And in our case, that would be number in position zero, one, two, three, four. And I would get the number four back out of it, right? An array is basically a list of values. Often numbers, they can be strings or characters or things as well, but an array is a list of things. So if an array is a list of things, a two-dimensional array is a list of of lists. So you'll see here, I've got this uh, this board array that has two sets of these curly brackets um, that are indexed by num rows and num columns. We'll come back to that in a sec. You'll see similarly, I have this pair of outer curly brackets here, much like when we were defining our array below. Oops, let's get that out of there. I have to practice that a little bit. Um, but the members of our array, the things that are separated by commas, instead of being digits like they were down here, are themselves arrays. We have another set of curly brackets and we have our own individual list of numbers down in here. And you can see in this case, I have eight, uh, eight digits across and I have eight arrays going down. This is how I'm going to store the data of what's going to appear on my LED matrix. This is just a structure that I chose because it seems, you know, I, I need 64 bits of data. They're arranged in eight rows and eight columns already. Uh, it seems like a pretty logical thing to me to store them in a two dimensional structure that essentially mimics the structure of this LED display. Um, so this is going to be our, our data structure where, uh, now of course we haven't told it yet what zero in any of these positions means or one or Fred or whatever these might be. Um, so we'll have to write that code as well. Um, but this will be the structure where we hold the information for uh, for outputting to our display. Cool. Um, so to get that information to our display, um, we're going to do uh, in code what I sort of hinted at we were going to do earlier. Much like we did with our four digit seven segment display last week, we're going to uh, turn on, uh, enable, I should say, one row at a time, and then selectively turn on just the columns in that row that should be turned on. Then we're going to move to the next row and we'll selectively turn on the, uh, the columns in that row that should be turned on and so on. So just to make that a little bit more concrete, um, let me say for the moment that a zero in any any of the positions in this array means that that LED should be off, and a one means that they should be on. So let's say uh, in our first row here, I had two ones, and in my second row here, 
I have some ones in other positions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my first, I'm going to enable my first row, uh, and then I'm going to turn on columns one and two only. And because all the other rows are, are disabled, only these LEDs in the top left corner here in position zero and one are going to turn on. Then I'm going to disable that row, enable the next row, and enable these columns, this column, and this column, and this column. Uh, and then because this is the only row that is enabled at that point, only these three LEDs will turn on and so on and so on. I'll move through the rows. Of course, these rows won't turn anything on because they're all zeros at the moment. And then we'll loop back to the top and we'll do this many, many times a second so that we see these five LEDs turn on at the same time if all goes right. So here's what that idea looks like in code. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, I've written this function here. Where do we want to start? Let's start back from our send int to display function, which is going to send 16 bits out, set the state of, uh, of our, sh our shish registers, essentially. Um, so our process is going to be essentially figure out what that 16-bit number is. That means that this row is enabled and these two columns are enabled and everything else is turned off. And then what is that 16-bit number that means that this row is enabled and these three columns are enabled? And then what's the, what's the, uh, the value that means this row is enabled but none of the columns are enabled? and so on. So um, I've built a little helper number for myself here that's going to give us a place to start. I've written this variable called all off, which is the state of the shift registers when everything is disabled. And the reason it's partly ones and partly zeros is if we go back to our circuit diagram here, we will remember, oops, come on. Oh, I've refreshed the thing. Dang. If we come back to our circuit diagram here <laughs> we'll remember that uh, the in our case the the columns are connected to the positive side of the LED I realized I actually spun this 90 degrees the columns are connected to the positive side of our LEDs and the rows are connected to the negative side of our LEDs so to uh, enable current to flow out through a row, I need that bit to be zero. I need that bit to be low. And to enable current to flow out, uh, flow in from a column, I need that bit to be high. In other words, the rows are active when their bits are zero, the columns are active when their bits are high. So when I look at this, uh, this number here, this 16-bit number with eight ones and eight zeros in it, the zeros are in the positions that correspond to the columns because those are disabled when they're low, and the ones correspond to the rows because they're, on, they're, uh, they're off when they are high. Um, we could use some code to generate this number for us automatically based on the, uh, the connections that we specified earlier. I think it's a, it, that's a little bit of a convoluted bit of code, so I've just generated that number for us. So this tells me when, when everything should be off, no rows enabled, no columns enabled, that bit one should be on, or I guess counting from the other end, right? Because we're going to go least significant bit first. Uh, bit one should be off, bit two should be off, bit three should be on, bit four should be off, bit five should be on, and so on. And that will correspond to the uh, the connections that we looked at earlier here. I'll shift this over for you. So uh, when everything is off, bit one should be, uh, bit one should be off, bit two should be off, right? And so on bit three should be on, and that corresponds to the columns and rows of our LED display. Does that sort of make sense? If it didn't, <laughs> I told you there's gonna be a lot of things sort of flowing fast here. This is the state of the shift registers when everything is off. Uh, the columns have to be low and the rows have to be high. So we're not, we don't have current flowing across any LEDs is the takeaway there. So once we've got that number, then for each row, it's just a matter of figuring out how do we modify that number to turn one row and some columns on. And this is how we're going to do it. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that this value number is what I'm gonna output at the end. So you see, I declare it here to start with something, and at the end, I'm gonna send it out to my display. I'm gonna send the display value. So it's just a matter of getting that value number to be correct. Um, so what we need to do is turn on one row and then turn on the columns for the LEDs in that row that should be on. So to turn on a row, I need to uh, set its value low because those turn on when they are low. So I'm gonna use this bit clear function. All bit clear does, it says make one uh, one bit of a number zero. Um, what number? This variable that I give you, value. Make one bit of that value zero. And which bit? Well, that's this function right here. And uh, if it looks a little convoluted, it is. It turns out that um, 
when I said I had pins 1 through 16 connected, I actually had switched them around. I pinned 16 through 1 connected. So rather than going 1 through 16, I actually am going through 15 minus 3. So I had to reverse my number. If you wire yours up correctly, um, you shouldn't need uh, this function here. So if, if nothing else, know that this row turns on the current row by setting its bit value to 0. And you can see I'm using this rows array that I uh, used earlier, right? So I'm going to look up uh, the bit in, if, if, if this seems a little bit complicated, I'm going to look up the bit in my shift register that corresponds to the current row using this rows array from earlier. And then I'm going to do some math on it so that I set the correct bit in my output value to zero, right? So I'm turning on that row by setting that bit to zero. And then for, uh, for each, um, for each position in that row that should be on, I need to make the bit in my number that corresponds to that column a one. And I can use this bit set function here to make a single bit of a variable into a one. It's a lot like the bit clear function, but this one makes a value a one. Which bits should be set to one? It's exactly the values in the row of our board whose value is greater than zero. So in row zero, uh, if we look in row zero of our, uh, our, our our board array here, when I look at the ith value, right, so i is going to go from zero to one less than number of columns, so zero to seven. If position zero is greater than zero, then I should turn on column zero. If position one is greater than zero, I should turn on column one. If position two is greater than zero, I should turn on column two, and so on. And once again, we're using this calls array to uh, individually turn on the appropriate bits in our number. Um, that correspond to the column connections on our matrix, right? So it's looking up which bit uh, in our shift register should be on to turn on those columns, and then it's setting that bit to be a one to set it to be high, right? So uh, let me uh, let me take a couple of questions I see happening over here, and uh, then we'll run this code. Did you manually tab over to every line on that array? Uh, yeah, I did have to do manual alignment uh, on that, but I think it makes it a lot easier to uh, to see things, especially when you have this this nice two D grid of things to work with. Um, it's uh, it's it's just a nice way to keep things lined up. And the yeah, it kind of says the the program just ignores it. Come back over here, and I've hidden the bench cam this time, which is really quite good. Um, so I've written this. All this function does right is it. Uh, it displays a row. It calculates the value that's associated with a given row of our array, and then it spits it out into our shift registers using this send int to display command that we wrote earlier, right? So just to demonstrate things, what I'm going to start with is I'm going to write row zero to my display. Wait a second. I'm going to write row one to my display. I'm going to wait a second. Um, and I still have my other functions happening here, my check input, my game state, etc. But uh, since they don't do anything, it should not matter. So let us after a lot of talking, let's apply power to our circuit board. Turn on the power supply. Thank you very much. Oh, and you can see I have some co <laughs> some code getting a little bit ahead of ourselves there from earlier in the evening. Um, I mean, make sure that my port is selected, that I've selected Arduino Pro Mini again, and we will upload this to the board. Looks like it's compiling. Looks like we're uploading. You can see we're uploading with our little blinking lights here, and we should see. There we go. So remember, we're outputting row zero and then outputting row one, and we're waiting a second in between. So these are those two ones we put in our display in the first row. This is one zero one one that we put in our display in the second row. Um, and so those those LEDs that are turning on currently correspond to this one and this one, and then one zero one one in this array. This polymer is why I really like having this two D array structure because whatever I see in uh, in this array is what I should be seeing on my board. And this is a really nifty proof of concept because it basically means using this display row function and by modifying this array, I can make what appears in front of me in this array appear on my board. So the gist of making my game is going to be figuring out what should be ones and what should be zeros at any point in this array. So um, to, uh, to introduce, so, so basically, we, we currently have this stepping through, you know, row zero, then wait a second, then row one, and wait a second. But really, we like to be doing this many, many, many times a second so that we, we don't see row zero, and then row one, and then row two, and then row three. We sort of see everything blended together. So to show that, I'm going to jump to the next example code that we have pulled down from the website, our multiplexing example. Um, 
multiplexing, as we talked about a little bit ago, just the idea of doing things in quick succession so quickly that the eye blurs them all together and they appear to be happening at the same time. So I've dumped a little bit of extra data in here in this example. I've got some ones, got some ones, one, one, one down here. So what I'm going to attempt to do is show you some code that will uh, take that, uh, take this nothing drawing here and make it appear seamlessly on the LED display. Um, and much like we looked at for our four digit seven segment display last time, I'm going to make use of a structure um, that doesn't, you know, doesn't use a delay function, doesn't wait around for things to happen. It just keeps a variable of the last time something was updated and a variable that says how often it should be updated. So um, you might think of this like, you know, I need to check on the baby once an hour. I hope you're doing it more than that, but I need to check on the baby once an hour. And the last time I checked on the baby was at 3.03. And then every, as fast as I can in the case of this program, I'm going to look at my watch and say, is it 303 plus an hour yet? No. Is it 303 plus an hour yet? No. Is it 303 plus an hour yet? Ah, yes. Now I will check on the baby. All right. Now the last time I've checked on the baby is 403, right? Is it time to check on the baby yet? No. Time to check on the baby yet? No. And so on. So right, we're just going to be checking constantly whether it's time for us to do anything. So for the sake of our display, I'm going to say that the, the time that we're going to wait in between checking whether it needs updates is 500 microseconds. In examples in previous weeks, we've been working in milliseconds, but given how fast we want the thing to be updating, I'm going to say we want to update this every half a millisecond. Um, the last time we updated the display was never, was at zero seconds since the start time. Um, and the current row that I've written to, let's say we'll start at row zero. Right, so we have these three new variables here, um, update, uh, display, update period, last display, update time, and current row. You'll notice that these are long integers, so they hold values up to 4.3 billion. Um, I think I mentioned last time that when you use the millis function that takes the number of milliseconds since you started running the program, that will overflow after a certain number of days. If you're counting in microseconds, a long integer overflows in about 70 minutes, um, which is plenty of time for a little game of snake. It may not be enough time for your specific application. So maybe we're something accounting for as you're writing your code. So once we have, uh, once we have these variables defined, um, I'm going to define a, uh, the first part of our display update function, one of our three core functions that are gonna make up our game. And it's gonna look like this. It says if micros, if, and micros returns the number of microseconds that have passed since your program started running, right? If essentially the current time in microseconds is greater than the last time we updated the display, plus the amount of time we're supposed to wait between updates, right? If if the current time is greater than the last time I checked on the baby, plus the amount of time I wait between baby checks, do something. And what am I going to do? I'm going to uh, increase to the, I'm gonna go to the next row, okay, current row equals current row plus one, right? I'm gonna increase to the next row. Uh, and then I'm gonna take that number modulo the total number of rows. And we looked at the modulo operator last time, basically returns the remainder when divided by a number. So this current row, given that we have eight rows, is gonna count from zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, S seven, and then gonna loop back to zero, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So I'm gonna increase to the next row. I'm going to display display that row and this display row function is the one we just wrote that calculates what should be on and what should be off for that row to be spit out and then I'm going to say okay the last time I checked on the baby was the current time and let's say this last display update time variable equals the current number of microseconds since we started things right and I'm going to run this function as fast as I humanly can well not humanly as fast as I Arduino Lee can every time I go through the loop it's going to be checking hey is this microseconds value greater than this value and usually the answer is no so no 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 but after enough time it'll be time to update that display again. I'm going to go to the next row and output its data into the shift register. So when we upload that code, come back over to the table. And after things are uploaded, we should see, there we go. So now this is still in actuality, updating one row at a time over and over and over again. It just, it's moving to the next row uh, after half of a millisecond. So it's going stepping through 2000 row transitions every second, which is a value that by experiment makes these blend together to my eye and for the camera so that it appears we have one solid image on the display. In fact, if I come back to the computer here, get rid of the bench to remember that. Um, if I increase my, um, my display update period from say uh, 5,000 milliseconds or 500 microseconds to 500 milliseconds, we can see its effect on our display here, right? Once that finishes uploading, it takes effect. We'll see that I'm stepping through each of those rows every half a second. So half a second update speed, it just clearly is not a seamless image. So we can just sort of start stepping that value down from there until we find one that works, right? I'm gonna knock a zero off that and we'll do this every 50 milliseconds. Uploading, 
booting better, right? We're getting a little bit closer. Let's knock that down to 5,000 milliseconds. Uploading. Booting. Close, right? We're sort of seeing the whole image, but it's still flickering. And so I'm going to end up down back at my original 500 microseconds for my update time. That was So that, that's basically the process that I did before this stream started to figure out how long that delay had to be for me to get a nice, smooth, continuous image here. So this is a really cool point in the development of our program because it means that now whatever data I put in this array will show up on my display. So for those of you who are here tonight to figure out how I, uh, how we use an, a seven segment, or not seven segment, use an eight by eight LED display to display data, you can basically rip this example, this uh, C example, C multiplex example, um, and use it, dump it into your own code. And whenever you do to modify that array, um, will show up as information on your LED display there. Super cool, right? The other cool thing is um, to, we have written some specific code to uh, take that array and drive this specific display. Um, but for people like Palmer, who have a slightly fancier display, um, we're going to go ahead and you know assume that this function that we've written, this uh, you know display update, uh, is going to sort of do the displaying for my code. But all this other game code, all it's going to do is sort of update the uh, update the ones and zeros of this array. So for Palmer, for example, to use a, a different piece of hardware, he should only have to change this display update code and possibly display row, some of the hardware specific things. But all this other logic is going to do is modify this array. So it, it should work with a variety of other output devices. And that's part of the cool thing about separating your programs out in this way into thinking about it in multiple discrete steps. One input, handling state and output is if you need to adapt to say another kind of input or another kind of output, the changes should be relatively minimal as long as you've taken the time to sort of break your code apart in this way, if that makes sense. Questions at this point? It's kind of a cool place to be. Mm. I'm going to take a quick beer break, um, and um, uh, when we come back, and by that I mean we're not leaving right now, uh, we're going to get into thinking about how we're going to build our actual game of Snake. Because now we have our display working, um, we're going to start to think about how do we glue the logic together um, that holds the state of a game and how we sort of use that to, to transition um, transition from one state in one moment to one state in the next moment. And we'll see that in just a second here. Oh, a lot of talking tonight, a lot of code, but it's really cool. This is the part where we're actually building programs that do things, um, which is a super, I know it's a super exciting place to be after only six weeks. I'm, I'm really stoked about it. Embedded, Kenneth says, embedded software engineering thinks a lot about the hardware abstraction layer, which is a line you draw between your software, draw in your software between stuff that depends on your hardware and stuff that doesn't. Yeah, exactly. So, so some of this code, right, depends on, depends on the specifics of the output hardware. All this stuff where I was defining which bits connect to which pins, that's all hardware specific. But this array doesn't know anything about the hardware that it's actually talking to. So this array and any code that's just manipulating it won't have anything to do with the specifics of our output. So that's a really that's a good way of thinking about it, Kenneth, is like where are things abstracted away from you and where are things are actually directly defined in their relation to hardware. So with that, let's jump to our next example, our D example from the website, which is where we will start to develop our game. Um, and actually, before we jump into it, I want to do just a little bit of thinking out loud about what the structure of our game of Snake might look like um, in terms of manipulating that array. So I've sort of recreated that array in, uh, in Google Slides here, and I've taken away the bench cam, which is good. Um, so here's how I'm going to represent a snake uh, in our game. For those who haven't played, I, man, I should have gotten a little video of it. If you'll have to stick around to the end, you'll see how the game is played. Um, you are an array of uh, a, a line of dots present on the screen. Um, and using your four directional controls, you can choose where the head of your line of dots, the head of your snake, moves uh, at the next regular time step. There will also be another single dot on the screen representing a target, or in our case, a piece of food. And when the head of your snake moves over that dot, your snake will grow in length by one segment. So to step back to the beginning for a sec, um, let's say within our array of uh, zeros, we have this snake of length four. These one, two, three, four spots uh, are going to represent the snake uh, moving across our, our display here. 
So in, in our case, if I wanted the snake to occupy these four LEDs, uh, these four positions in our, our, our data field, these four LEDs would be on. Um, and let's say that I, I want the next direction that it's going to move to be either up or left or right. So it's going to have to have some sense of not only where, which positions are going to be uh, turned on at any given time, but which direction our snake is heading and where its head is, right? So I'm going to need to know um, where the head of this snake is, where the circle is, and what direction it's flowing in. Um, so, like I say, we're gonna have to think about its head position, direction of travel, and we're gonna need to know something a little bit about the total length of the snake. Um, so I'm gonna create some variables to start with, if we start thinking about this, to hold the, uh, hold the position of the snake. In this case, we're going to be in position 210, right? So counting from 0, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 2, 6. Um, I'm going to need to store the direction of travel in some way. Um, and I've chosen to store the four possible directions as an index where uh, zero is up, one is left, two is down, and three is right. There are lots of different ways that you could store this information, and we'll, we'll look more in detail as to how it's stored later. But having um, up and down, zero and two, be two apart, and one and three, left and right, be two apart, is going to let us do a little clever math trick to uh, eliminate some things later that we shouldn't be able to do. And I'm also going to need a variable to store the total length of my snake at any given time. So I'm going to make a variable called snake length, right? So thinking through this data structure of the game in my head starts to tell me a little bit about what other variables I'm going to need to be able to update the state of this game um, and, and track the information as things move along. Um, the other thing I, that this makes me think is that, um, so I have this snake of length four moving up here. So this is at one moment in time. Let's say it does move up uh, one position. What will happen to the information in our display? Well, as I step this forward, um, we can see that our snake has moved one position up. Its head is now here. Its direction is still up. Um, these four LEDs are now lit and this one is off. But as we look at the sort of numbers as they change between these two positions, we notice that something interesting is happening, right? If we say that the head of our snake um, is uh, is uh, the the number four, right? The total length of our snake, and its second position is three, and then two, and then one. We see that a move in the direction that we're traveling corresponds to decreasing each of those numbers by one, and then making the head of the snake, wherever that new head position is, equal to the length of the snake. Does that track? So starting here, right, taking a look at this position down here, as you move away from it, it goes from being a one to being a zero. This position here goes from being two to being a one. This position here becomes goes from a three to a two. And this position up here, let's say that we're moving into, goes from being a zero to wherever the head now is becomes a four. So moving a snake across our field, essentially, is going to be setting a new position for the head, making that position equal to the total length of the snake, and decreasing the values in these other positions by one to, to no less than zero, I suppose. So let's look at that in code and I think it will make just a little bit more sense. I'm just to pick a peek at questions. Wow, some thoughts about a TI-83 from high school. Yeah, I still have mine around here somewhere. Oh man, if I could dig it out in under five seconds, I would, but perhaps for another time. Um, so looking at our code example, and this is code example D from the website if you're playing along at home. Um, we still have our clock pins defined. All of this should be the same. Um, ah, here we go. So here's some new things. So like I said before in our slides, I'm going to need a variable to hold the length of our snake. I'm going to need a variable to hold the position of our snake. And I've chosen to make it an array of length too. Since I need an X and a Y coordinate, it just makes sense to me for me to hold them in this little, you know, little coordinate pair we can think of it as. So this little array of length, you're going to have the X and Y coordinates stored here. Um, getting ahead just a little bit, you'll see I've also defined this game update period and last game update time variable here because we're going to use a structure very similar to our display update um, to tell the game when the snake should move next, when we should sort of advance to the next frame of action. Um, in game programming languages, sometimes that's called a tick, um, the minimum unit of time that passes between actions. Um, it's going to be much, much longer than our display uptight time, which remember we said it was 500 microseconds. I only want to update this every 400,000 microseconds, about half a second. Um, so that's going to be a nice long time between actions of our snake, but we're going to use those variables in a very similar way. Um, so I define my snake length to start with, my head position. Um, and then here's where I, I need a variable to hold the direction that I'm traveling in. And again, I'll explain my choice of why we're storing it like this in a little bit. Um, and then for each of those directions, um, what I've chosen to store is the changes in the coordinates of the snake's head for each direction that we could move. So if we're moving in direction zero, 
in position zero of this dir coords, <laughs> direction coordinates array, position zero says direction zero corresponds to moving zero in the x direction and minus one in the y direction. So in our case, that'll be up. Uh, position one corresponds to moving one in the x direction and zero in the y direction. Uh, position two is zero in the x direction and one in the y direction. And position three is minus one in the x direction and zero in the y direction. So, so our, four, our four possible moves, we either move one up or one down in either direction. Those will be the four possible ways that the head of our snake can move between turns. Um, and then, uh, let's see. Oh, and then I, what I've done here is I've stored um, the current direction that the snake is moving is going to be just going to hold uh, some one of these four pairs at any given time, either zero minus one, one zero, etc. So this snake direction variable is going to hold, I you know, zero one or one zero or zero minus one and so on. So we'll basically be taking the current position of the snake's head and adding the snake direction variable to it to tell us which direction that snake's head is going to move for each turn. I'm hoping I'm explaining this all right. I guess when we run it, maybe it'll make just a little bit more sense. All this display data is the same, right? We have this display set up. We really don't need to touch this display code in between um, in between code segments um, at any point now. So, um, so that's we sort of set up some variables to hold our snake, but we're going to need to give it a place to start. And um, just to give ourselves a, a place to start with in our setup function here, you see I'm still uh, enabling everything as an output, but then I'm going to use an initialize function just to set the initial state of our game. I'm going to put some put a snake on our board, um, and uh, ultimately we'll be doing this uh, with a little bit more variety. But for testing purposes, what I encourage you to think about is just just get the thing working. Type in some data manually. Just just get the thing on the board, right? So here's what I'm going to use as my initialize function to start with right now. First, I'm going to reset the board, and reset board is a function I wrote that just makes everything zero. Every single position with a step through a pair of for loops and make that board position zero. Take everything to not start again. This is a good example of ways to interact with a two-dimensional array, by the way. We're going to use this nested for loop structure. When us take i is going to go from zero to the number of rows and j is going to go from zero to the number of columns. So as we go through board position i and position j, we're going to touch every single position in every row and every column of that board. And in our case, we're going to make them all zero. So starting our initialize function by uh, taking everything back to zero. Um, for the time being, I'm going to say that my snake's head starts at position 2-6, um, which is exactly the uh, the position that it was in uh, in our example here. We said that the snake's head was in position 2-6. In fact, I'm going to recreate this example that we've drawn in our code. So snake head should be at 2-6, direction should be up with a total length of 4. So do that in code. The x coordinate, the zero coordinate of our snake's head is going to be uh, at position two, and the y coordinate, the one position of our snake's head, is going to be at uh, at position six. This is um, a pretty common construction. So we were thinking earlier about our coordinate pairs. Like you remember back to geometry of being pairs of x and y. In our case, that's going to correspond to positions zero and I say positions zero and one position zero and one of our two position array. Um, you, there's no reason it has to be that way. This could be y and x um, or something like that. But I think of thinking of them as x and y is just a, a common convention and one that I'm going to be consistent with throughout my code, right? So I'm going to set my snake head position here to be two comma six. Um, and then I'm going to modify the values stored in our board array so that those values are the same as these red numbers here. So rather than just storing zeros and ones, right, because this is an array not of zeros and ones, but of any integer we want, I'm going to say that this position is a four, this position is a three, this position is a two, and this position is a one. And that's what I've done manually here. So position two, six is a four, then three, six is a three, position Four, six is a two, five, six is a one. And that's exactly what we have here. Position zero, one, two, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six is a four, three, six is a three, two, and one, and so on. So I've just manually recreated that board state. And then to give ourselves the correct direction, I said that we're moving in direction three to start with, which corresponds to uh, a position in our direction coordinates array where we're moving minus one and zero with each step. Uh, and that corresponds to direction three. Uh, and then the snake direction x coordinate is going to be the x coordinate of that direction. The snake direction y coordinate is going to be equal to the y coordinate of that snake direction. 
if I've lost you, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, basically, I have manually set up a state for this game so that the, the game is tracking where the head of the snake is, uh, where the body of the snake is with those numbers 4, 3, 2, and 1, just like in our example there, and which direction the snake is traveling in, and it knows that traveling in that direction corresponds to adding or subtracting a specific 1 or 0 from each of the x or y coordinates uh, each time the snake moves. Cool? Um, so we said to move a snake in a specific direction was going to be to uh, move the snake head to a new place, make it equal to the length of the snake, and then subtract one for everywhere else. So that's what I'm going to do in the first draft of our game state update. And you'll see I'm using this very familiar construction by now. This, if the time is greater than the last time we checked on the baby, plus the time we're supposed to wait between checking on babies, um, then do something. Remember, this is about half a second, so we're going to take quite a bit longer between game states. So if it's time for us to check on the baby, if it's time for us to do something new, we're going to move the head of the, of the snake in the direction indicated by the x and y coordinates of this snake direction variable. And you can see I'm using this plus equals construction. We looked at this a few weeks ago. Basically, this is the same as saying snake head position zero equals snake head position zero plus snake direction zero, right? This plus equals construct just says add this to that and store it in that. And it's a common enough thing that we have this shorthand of plus equals to do it with, right? So move the snake's head in the direction indicated by snake direction, then subtract one from every other position on the board using this subtract board function that we've written. Then we'll set the, uh, the position on the board underneath the snake's head, right? So board, the board uh, array value under the x coordinate of the snake's head and the y coordinate of the snake's head should be equal to the length of the snake. And then we'll remember, hey, we checked on the baby at this point in time. Let's record that. Um, real quick before we run it, so we'll take a quick look at the subtract one from every position function. It should be pretty straightforward. Um, all it says, if uh, if this, we're going to, again, loop through every position in this 2D array, and if it's bigger than zero, subtract one from it. That's all that function says, right? I don't want any zeros to become less than zero, but anything that's bigger than zero, knock one away from it, right? So when we upload this code, things will happen, I hope. So it's all, the snake is always going to start in the same place because we hard-coded where it starts. <laughs> and you can see uh, it pretty quickly runs away. And the reason it actually moves over here is that when you start writing to an array from a, for an index that you have not defined, right? When I start writing to row minus one and row minus two, where that information actually goes is undefined. So it turns out that when I'm writing that information uh, into the array in a place that it doesn't belong, the data actually gets a little bit corrupted and the snake starts appearing over here. But you can see now that my snake appears in the position that we said it would from its example, then it moves up the screen. Now it goes away and, and doesn't last very long, but now we have the basics of our snake moving across the screen. Tremendously exciting. Holy crap. Ah, good question so far. <laughs> I feel a little bit, I'll be honest, like talking about code is a little bit like dancing about architecture. It's not quite the right medium to be communicating this with. Um, so I really do encourage you to go go to the website for um, for episode six, which this is, and not episode five. Wow, that's embarrassing. This is episode six, <laughs> um, and uh, and check out the code and play around with it live because I really think you will take as much away from it as you will from me uh, yapping at you about it. But. Um, but yeah, so now, so we're at the point where we have a snake, uh, we have a display working, we have the snake moving across the screen. That's, that's tremendous. Um, so before we get into the actual gameplay, let's, we have, we have the basics of our display, we have the basics of our gameplay, let's do the basics of our input so we can move our snake around and then we can get more complicated from there. So for that, we will go to the next bit of example code from our website. Excuse me. Our first input example, the E example from the website. Um, we should all, the, the code that we're introducing in this example will look fairly familiar. Um, so we've defined the pins that are four buttons that we have down here are connected to. These buttons you'll recall are connected to uh, the pin of the Arduino on one side and ground on the other. So we, de we defined which, uh, which pins on the Arduino those buttons are connected to, how many we have, and as usual, we've wrapped them into an array. I don't think any of this is new. 
we come down to our setup function. And as before, we're gonna step through the all the, the uh, buttons in that array and set them to be this input pull up type that we know so well, right? So when the button is not pressed, that pin is going to be pulled gently up to high. When the button is pressed, it's going to pull that pin down to ground, right? So that's the only change in this part of our code so far. Um, what I'm going to want to write though is this check input function, right? Because we have our display basically working. We have the, the rudiments of our game state, right? We add a snake and it runs away off the screen. Let's write a little bit of this check input function, right? So here's what that's going to start as. Um, we're going to define a new array within our function here called button state. I'm just going to use it to record whether each button is pressed or not. It's going to be an array of booleans, which I don't think we've actually talked about in this uh, series yet. A boolean is a variable that just holds a value of true or false. Um, so you can see this array of booleans I'm going to initialize as false, 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 false. This is really useful when you're working with things that are going to evaluate to being true or false. Is the button pressed or not? Because you can talk about them not as you know zero or one, but is one on or is one off? We can just talk about them as true or false. It's a really useful thing. So once I've defined this array, I'm going to go through my four buttons and say if digital read of that button is low, right? If the button is pressed, then make the uh, the matching value in this array true, right? So if button one is low, if button one is pressed, uh, button state one should be true. If button zero is pressed, button state zero should be true, and so on. I'm just gonna go through all of my buttons and see if any of them are pressed. And then I'm going to, uh, to take some action based on whether those buttons are pressed. And that's what this is going to look like, right? So what I want to do if a, uh, if a button is pressed, here's what I want to do. If, uh, if my snake is traveling up, for example, the only directions that I want it to be able to travel next are left or right. If my snake is traveling left or right, I only want it to be able to change to up or down, right? I don't want the snake to be able to be heading up and then press the button for down and it automatically runs into itself and explodes. Um, there are some variants of Snake, including some old mean arcade versions where that is how the programming works, but I'm going to choose that when you're traveling up or down, you can only turn left or right. When you're moving left or right, you can only turn to, to move up or down. So here's how I'm going to encapsulate that in code. I'm going to say if direction mod two equals zero. So essentially if would say the remainder when you divide the direction index by two is zero, or in other words, if the direction is even, I'm going to look at buttons one or in three. Otherwise, if the direction is odd, I'm going to look at buttons two and zero, right? If I'm, if I'm moving in an odd direction, I only want to look at the even buttons. If I'm moving in an even direction, I only want to look at the odd buttons. This is what uh, motivated me earlier to choose the um, what these different indices mean, these directions zero, one, two, three, and four, uh, zero, one, two, and three, so that even means up and down and odd means left and right. There are, of course, lots of other ways you could encapsulate this information, but this seemed like a, a straightforward way to me at the time. So um, if the direction is even, if we're traveling up or down, if button one is pressed, which I think is the left button, I, I might be wrong, but if button one is pressed, then the direction should be uh, now direction one, and the snake direction X coordinate should be the X coordinate of direction one here, and the snake direction Y coordinate should be the Y coordinate of direction one. If not, if button three is pressed, say the right button, the direction should be three, we should be uh, the X coordinate of the direction button should be the X coordinate of direction three. The Y coordinate of the direction vector should be the Y coordinate of direction three and so on. If this feels like I'm repeating myself quite a bit, it's because, well, all of us already, it seems like we could encapsulate these two things into a function. If we want to change directions, we need to set the direction and change these, this, uh, change this array, change this vector of which way the snake is heading. So let's just cut to the chase and go to our next example, our F as in Foxtrot example, where we've written Let's see, oops, where did you go? Our F is in Foxtrot example, where we've encapsulated this change direction function into a new function called set new direction, uh, which just takes a direction, makes the direction equal to it, and then sets our X and Y coordinates for us. That'll clean things up a little bit here. It basically says, you know, if our direction is even, if we press button one, we're going in direction one, else if we're pressing button three, go in direction three. Similarly, if our direction is odd, if we press up, go up. If we press down, go down, right? This prevents us from going back on ourselves or pressing an up button and continuing to go up when we're already going up and so on, right? So let's upload that to our board and hopefully we will have a snake that we can now control. There we go. You can see when I press the right button there, the snake moves right. I press the up button, it should move up. 
<laughs> now it's wrapped around the edges of the screen and some wonky things may happen. But there we go. Now we have the basics of a controllable snake. So all it's doing is looking to see which buttons are pressed and changing that direction vector uh, based on uh, the state of that, that Boolean array that we defined, that button press variable. And you'll see if I'm moving up here and I press down, nothing happens. That conditional logic that we wrote that says we're only going to look at the down button if, um, if we are moving left or right is working, which is great. And of course, we can still run away off the top of the screen. Uh, we can still run over the left and right edges. And if we do, some wonky things can happen in our arrays, but we'll get to that code in just a little bit here. So snake is moving around the screen, accepting input. Uh, we are displaying it on our LED display and we have the basics of uh, how we're managing our game state. So that's, that's a really cool place to be. Um, let's add one more feature, which is uh, sort of the goal of our game, which is to eat little bits of food. Um, little other points that are going to appear on our display, we want to move our snake over to them and eat them, causing our snake to grow. Um, so I'm going to need a couple of variables to handle this. Um, one is another two-dimensional array to hold the X and Y position of where our food is this time. Um, and you might have guessed, um, I'm going to need a... a a new set of these update period and update time variables because I'm going to make our food flash. That's how we're going to sort of distinguish the point that is our little food dot from the snake itself. It's going to flash on and off many times a second. In our case, I'm gonna say it's gonna turn on or off every uh, 100,000 microseconds, every uh, tenth of a second that'll be. Um, and I'm gonna use a variable called food state here. I'm gonna say start it at zero. It's gonna be uh, if it's a zero, my food should be off at the moment. If it's uh, one, it's going to be on at the moment. So we'll look at that structure in just a little bit. Um, so, um, I'm going to need to do a couple of things. First, I'm going to need to initialize where that food is. I'm going to need to put it somewhere when we start. So I'm going to put it into this initialize gameplay function uh, in our setup function here. Um, and you'll see that I've also snuck in this random seed bit of code here. We talked about randomness a couple weeks ago. Um, if you're going to make use of a random function to choose a random number, which tonight we are, um, if you don't use this random seed function, your randomness turns out to be the same randomness every single time. By taking this random seed of an analog pin um, that's not connected to anything, you make sure that random truly is random is the gist of it. So um, since I'm going to be doing some randomness here in a second, I've made sure to seed my random number generator with this analog read value. So inside my initialize gameplay function, um, I've done a, a little bit of a new thing. Um, right, this is all going to be the same. Snakes always starts in the same place, but I've called this make food function at the end of my initialize gameplay function. And make food is really simple. All it's going to do is say, I'm going to look at a number x and a number y and ultimately those are going to be the x and y coordinates of my food but i'm going to use this do while loop that we talked about last week two weeks ago um I'm going to say x is going to be a random number in the rows and y is going to be a random number in the columns and we're going to iterate that as long as that position is not zero so you remember by this point in our code we've already plopped our snake down on the board i don't want my food to be overlapping with any part of the snake's body i only want to a food to appear in an empty space where that board array is still zero so what this is going to do right because i'm in this do loop i'm going to always run this code once and then I'm going to check if this is true. I'm going to say, oh, is, um, is board XY uh, not equal to zero? Oh, there's a snake there? Well, then I better go back to the top and pick another pair of random numbers for this X and Y. Is it zero? Oh, it is zero. Well, then we can exit out of this loop and we can say that our, the X coordinate of our food position is this X and this Y coordinate of our food position equals Y. So this little bit of um, this do while loop here is a good structure to remember. Again, I know this is like a, just a of words tonight, but here's a useful structure to take away. If you are needing to generate a starting value um, and then sort of um, check whether it's workable, check whether it's functional, this do while structure where we generate our random number or our starting condition within our do while loop and then make ourselves go back uh, if the condition that we want is not met is a good way of sort of finding an initial or workable value for something, especially something that you're picking at random. Cool. So that's all we've added to our initialize gameplay function. I'm going to pick a pick a position for our food, essentially. And then we'll need to make a couple of changes to our um, our check game state function to handle our food. Because we're going to need to turn on or off that position of the board uh, every time uh, every time we, we we to make it flash, essentially. We turn that position on or off to make our food flash. So this code is all the same, right? If um, uh, 
if the if we have not checked the baby in long enough, we may need to move our snake. This is all the same. Outside of that loop, right, outside of this if function here, I'm also going to do a very similar instruction involving micros. Do we need to update the food flicker? So again, if uh, if the time is, is greater than the last time we checked on the baby plus the time we need to check on the baby. And notice that this is a different set of update times from the time we're updating our game. This is the time just based on flickering our food, right? So um, this if current time is greater than last time we checked on it plus time to wait structure is a really good way of thinking about ways to multitask in your code. Palmer, I feel like we called this the Palmer question like two or three weeks ago um, of how do you get something to do multiple things at once? It might've been the Chris Wick question. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but but if you took only one line of code away from tonight, uh, it, might, it might be the 2D array. If you took two lines of code, this if micros or millis is greater than last update time plus this period, and if it is, do something and then update the current time that you're storing, uh, is a really good structure to take away with you, right? So in our case, what I'm going to do is if it's time to update the food flicker, I'm going to say food state equals one minus food state. So if food state is zero, it's going to become one minus zero, which is one. So if it's one, it becomes zero. And then I'm going to set that position on the board to be our food state, right? So the, the food position on the board is either going to become one or zero, one or zero, one or zero. Um, and then one last little change I need to make to the code at this point is our subtract function. Um, let's see, do I need to update that? I don't think I'd need to do. So if I update this bit of code, the G bit of code for those following along at home. Kenneth says the 2D array was like six lines of code. Yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> so let's update here and you'll see I now have a little bit of flickering food. And you'll notice that the, the period with which I'm updating the position of the snake doesn't have anything to do with the uh, the rapidity with which I'm updating the flickering position of the food. You'll also notice that, of course, that um, moving over the food doesn't do anything yet, right? We haven't uh, we haven't written any code that actually allows us to eat the food. Um, but, uh, but we now have a piece of flickering food somewhere random, and the snake can still move around the screen and be controlled. So that's progress. Um, so let's write a bit of code that uh, allows us to eat the food. Um, this will be the H example from our website. Do, do, do. The eat food example, I think I called it, which is quite good. Um, so um, we, have a, we have a function that places the food somewhere. We have our snake moving around. We know where its head is. So really, if the snake's head and the food are in the same location, we should eat the food, lengthen the snake by one, and put the food somewhere new. So that's exactly the changes that we're going to make to our game logic in our uh, check game state function here. So here's our check game state function, right? If it's time to update the game state, we move the snake's head, we subtract one from every board position, we put the head in its new place. This is all the same as before, right? And here's our new code. If the x coordinate, right, this zero coordinate of the snake's head is the same as the x coordinate of the food, and this, the y coordinate of the snake's head is the same as the y coordinate of the food. Remember this double and symbol here is a logical and. So this is true if and only if both sides are true. If the x coordinates match and the y coordinates match, the snake's head and the food are in the same position. So if that is true, here's what we'll do. The snake should get one unit longer, right? Remember this plus plus construction here, which just means add one to this variable. Um, I think I said when we introduced it, it's a thing we want to do often enough that we have this shorthand for it. This is exactly the kind of situation we have, right? Snake length plus plus. Add one to snake length, please. Um, then I'm going to want to add one to every position on the board so that those positions don't go away for one additional step. That will have the effect of lengthening that snake instead of being four, three, two, one. It will now be five, three, two, five, four, three, two. So when we move ahead, we'll have one more position of our snake. That'll make sense when we see it on paper here, right? So we're gonna add one to every position on the board using this add board function, which I don't know that we need to look at. Believe me, it steps through every position on the board and says if it's uh, if it's not zero, add one to it. And then we're going to reuse our make food function, which is going to pick a random unoccupied spot on the board and put a piece of food on it, right? This is one of the joys of encapsulating a little bit of code like that into a function is we can use it in multiple places, right? I put this make food function in our setup function. I'm now going to use it again to make a random piece of food appear whenever we eat one. So let's upload that code and have a look. So as always, we're going to always appear in the same four spots over here on the side of the board. There we go. But now when I move the snake's head over the food, we'll see we now have a snake of length five. And when I eat it again, oops, well, 
not a very good snake player, which will make tonight a little bit complicated, but we'll reset that one more time. You can also see, though the snake is starting in the same place every time, the food, of course, is random, right? We had it select a random X and Y coordinate, and it's never appearing underneath the snake because we only allowed it to check positions. We only allowed it to appear in positions um, that the snake is not covering. Now you can see here, um, though I'm traveling over the food, the snake is not eating it. And that's because I wrapped around from one edge of the screen to the another, um, which is confusing our variable logic somewhat. Um, it, it's not referencing the position of the snake accurately anymore. And so it doesn't know um, that the snake and the food are in the same place. So because we don't have any uh, anything checking to prevent the snake from wrapping around from one side of the screen to the other, um, that's confusing that collision logic a little bit there. So let's add some collision logic to prevent the snake from going outside of the screen. This will be our I example in our code. All right, so um, we're gonna just make some um, make some uh, further additions to our uh, check game state function, and it will look like this. Um, rather than just saying every time we want to update, right? Remember last time in our example, every time we wanted to update, we just went ahead and moved the snake. This time, we're going to uh, create this new variable, this temporary position that's going to hold the position of the snake's head if it was going to move without moving it yet, right? So temp position is going to be the snake's head position plus the snake direction for both the X and the Y coordinate. Say, hey, if that snake's head moved, where is it gonna be? And I'm gonna feed those values into this new function that we'll show you in a second called is valid position. And is valid position is going to tell us whether that position is in bounds or out of bounds. And only if it is valid, only if it's in bounds, are we going to move. If it's out of bounds, well, we could choose whether we wanted to do. I haven't made it do anything yet, um, but if, if it's out of bounds, we could have it crash, we could have it subtract length, we could have it do whatever we want. Um, but this is a way of, so we're gonna prevent the snake from running off the edge of the board by using this is valid position function. And that is valid position function looks like this. It's going to take two numbers, an X and a Y coordinate. Um, and you'll notice that most of our other functions have had the word void in front of them, but this has the word bool for Boolean. Now, why is that? Well, we've sort of, we've glossed over this concept, but there really are in some ways two different kinds of functions we've been using, even the ones that are built into the Arduino language, right? We have ones like pin mode, which do something, and we don't ask anything back from them. We say, hey, go out and do this thing and uh, take some action in the universe. And then we have other functions um, like digital read, uh, which we're saying, hey, go out and do something and hand me back the result so I can evaluate it, assign it to a variable, what have you, right? When you hand a value back from a function, that's called returning a value from a function. And it's something that we've been doing all the time with this digital read function and, and analog read and a bunch of others, right? Where we're asking this function to go out and do something, look at the voltage on the pin, analog or digital, and give me a value back. And we can write our own functions that give us a value back. So in this case, I've written a function that takes an X and a Y coordinate, and it's going to give me back a Boolean, a true or false value, um, that tells me whether this X and Y coordinate is within the board. So again, a, this, a, a quick digression. If, if this has just been a wall of words for the past 10 minutes, and it might have been, and I don't blame you, it's been a wall of words, um, this is a, a good point to take away. We can write functions not only that go out and do things, but we can write functions that evaluate data or give us a response back by changing that void keyword in front of this function here to the type of variable that we want to give back to the rest of our program. In this case, it's a Boolean. I can write a function that returns an integer, right? That does some math, does some multiplication and returns uh, a number to us, um, a really useful programming construct. Cool. So in our case, um, I'm going to create this Boolean called valid, um, and uh, I'm going to return it here at the end. I'm going to use this contract called return valid. I'm going to take this, this value of this variable and give it back to whatever function uh, was asking for this value earlier in the code. So I'm going to start valid by being true, but if x is less than zero or greater than the number of rows, right? Remember our double lines here mean or. If x is less than zero or greater than the number of rows, we're not valid. And same, if y is less than zero or y is greater than the number of rows, then we're not valid, right? So valid starts as true, but if either of these things holds or both, then we turn up as false and hand that value back to our program, right? So we use that variable up here. We say, is this new position where the snake's head is going to be a valid one? 
If so, we can go ahead with our code as before and move it there. But if it's not, for the moment, we will do nothing. So let's upload that code and take a look at it. So as usual, our snake starts in the same place. But when it gets to a wall, you'll notice it stops. It doesn't run off the edge anymore, right? It's creating a, uh, a temporary position that's one off of the edge of the board here. It's saying, is that a valid position? Ooh, it's not. So I'm not going to move the head of that snake. But as soon as I change the direction with one of these buttons, boop, there we go, we can see that the snake continues moving. So, right, so when the snake is heading in the upward direction and it hits a wall, it for the moment, it just stops. It does nothing. It tries to update. It says, hey, is that new place I'm going to move valid? Oh, it's not? Well, then I have nothing I'm supposed to do on this step. Right, so that's currently the behavior when our snake runs into a wall. And you can see we can run around eating food, uh, eating food as before. So that's a pretty cool step, right? Now we have our snake confined to its snake pen of this display. Um, but uh, so far, it's not a particularly challenging game because there's no way to lose it. Uh, I can just run around running into walls and running into the snake forever. Let's uh, let's introduce the sort of final key concept of, uh, of the game itself, which is that if you run into yourself as a snake, you lose. So let's go on to our J example. I think there's only two more examples after this. We're making really good time. Um, let's move on to our J example, um, which is uh, our game over example. And we'll show you how you introduce a, um, a, a game over setup into your, into your code. So I'm going to introduce a new variable to tell us whether we're in the game over state or not. It's going to be another one of these Boolean variables, right? It's true or false. I'm going to start out as false. So we don't start with a game over. We'll say game over is false. And then I'm going to wrap my whole game state code, my whole check game state direction code, say, hey, if we're not in a game over state, do everything we've been talking about. However, if we are in a game over state, then game over is true. And we're going to run this function to show game over. So rather than updating the position of the snake and flickering the food and doing all this other nonsense, we're going to run this other show game over function. And that show game over function just looks like this. All I'm going to do is I've defined this other array called the game over board, which has, I don't know if you can tell what that picture is. If not, you'll see it on the, on the table in a second here. It's just going to copy position for position, the contents of that game over board into the board array, right? So we're not going to be drawing a snake. We're not going to be drawing uh, anything else. We're just going to be setting the board to look like this picture. Um, and that's going to be how, how our game ends. Um, so that's going to be what happens when we get to the game over state. Let's write some code to get us there. Like what we, when the snake crashes into itself, or in other words, when the head of the snake attempts to move into a position already occupied by the body of the snake, we should be at a game over state. So that logic looks like this. Um, so remember, like, here's our here's our check game state function. If we're not in the game over state, if it's time for us to update the position of our snake, we're still creating that same temporary position and then checking it to see if it's uh, if it's inside the boundaries of the board. And then here's our new bit of code. If the uh, value of the board array at the position we're trying to move into is already not equal to zero, right? We haven't moved there yet, but it's already if it's not uh, if it's not empty, we have a problem. But we also need to check whether there's food there. Because remember, the food state can alternate between zero and one. So we want to check if the board state is not empty and it's not true that we're in the position of the food, right? So uh, we want to make sure that we're not overlapping the food itself. Then game over will be true. And you'll see it actually snuck in this return keyword here as well with nothing after it. Uh, even for a function that returns nothing, if you use this return keyword, you will immediately exit out of the... Uh, out of the current function you're in, right? There's no point in us processing any of the rest of this logic because I'm just gonna get straight to the game over the screen. So I'm gonna use this return function to exit out of the game state function. So the next time we get here, we'll get to our game over display. So let's upload that code, check it out on the table, and we'll see if I can crash the snake. Boop. Are we uploading? There we go. All right, snake is moving, let's see. So remember, I have no code that tells me what to do when I get to walls other than to just stop. So running into walls is free, but running into myself is not. So I'll make a medium length snake here. Oh, come on, get there, get that food. And then let's crash into ourselves here. And when I do, oop, come on, it's harder to crash than I thought it would be. Come on, there we go. 
we display our game over state. So this is the uh, the picture that was hiding in that game over board array uh, is this frowny face here. So when we're in our, when our game over variable becomes true, we're gonna skip all the rest of our game logic. We're just gonna copy this picture into the display. And now we're gonna sit here forever. That's uh, that's the end of the game. To play again, you actually have to hit the reset button and start things all over again. Um, I will leave it as an exercise to a reader to think of a way that you might be able to play again. What would you need to do? What would you need to reset? What would you need to start over to start another game after say three seconds uh, of waiting after a game over or five seconds or something like that? Oop, crashed again, right? So the only way to start again currently is the reset button. Um, so we have a more or less complete game of Snake here. The one thing that I want to add is uh, currently our Snake always starts in these four dots here and starts by moving up. Let's um, let's look at randomizing a starting position because it's again, it's another good chance to look at how you sort of guess and check at valid positions for things to start in, which is a good way to deal with randomness. So this will be our, uh, our K example um, in our code. Um, so the only updates that we're going to make here are two our initialize game state function. You remember that uh, this is the function we're calling at the end of our setup function to put the snake in its initial place. And let's just go initialize gameplay. It's going to look a little bit different this time. So much like last time, we're gonna start by setting the board to all zero. Um, and then we're gonna use a very similar construction to this do while loop I used earlier. I'm gonna define this Boolean called is problem. And we're going to see uh, if there is a problem. Inside our do loop, I'm going to start with my is problem variable false. There is no problem, we will be fine. That gives us lots of ways inside of our loop as we're generating uh, potential starting places for our snake. If at any point any of them turns out not to work, I'm going to set this is problem variable to true. And when I get to the end of my do while loop all the way down here, I'm gonna say, if there is a problem, I have to do this all again, right? So by setting this, this problems checking variable to false at the start of our loop and seeing, making sure it's still false at the end of our loop. I can sort of give myself lots of ways to say in the middle of this and checking the position of the snake and its direction and where the rest of its body goes. If I ever fail, if there's ever a problem, we're just gonna have to do the whole thing over again. So here's how the process of generating that random snake is going to work. I'm going to pick a random position for the X and Y coordinates of my snake's head, right? So it's gonna be a random number between the number of rows and zero and with zero in the number of columns. Those are gonna be the X and Y coordinates where my snake's head starts. And I'm going to just go ahead and make that position on the board the snake length, right? In our case, it's going to be a four where that snake's head is. I'm then going to pick a random direction between zero and three. Uh, and I'm going to set the snake direction variables like we did before. It's X coordinate is going to be the X coordinate of that direction. The Y coordinate will be the Y coordinate of that direction. Um, and a lot like before, I'm gonna start creating these temporary positions to check whether the various positions of the snake's body will be our valid positions. Um, so first I'm going to say, so I'm gonna start with that temporary position being where the snake's head is. Uh, and then I'm going to say, um, uh, I'm going to move backward along the snake's body, seeing if each val each position in that snake's body is valid. So I'm going to say, take my temporary position, uh, the x-coordinate of my temporary position, and subtract the x-coordinate of my direction, right? So if I was moving, if I was adding that direction, I'd move forward. If I subtract, I sort of move backward along the snake. I'm going to subtract the x and y coordinates of that direction, and then test if they're valid. And I'm going to reuse this is valid position function here. Um, say, hey, is that snake's body still on the board? Uh, if it's not, using this not operator here, the exclamation point is not, if it's not valid, I have a problem. Set the board back to zero. Um, otherwise, um, we're going to make that uh, that position on the board equal to the next number lower in the snake's body, right? So we start with a length of four, then we take a step backward along the snake's body in the opposite of the direction of travel, and say, hey, is it still on the board? If it is, set that to a three. Then we'll step backward one more step. We'll take I minus minus in this for loop. Uh, set that's a, that take one step backward against the direction of the snake. Is it a valid position? If it is, then uh, set that to a two and so on. And basically, we're gonna repeat this problem, and re repeat this loop until there are no problems with any of the positions of the snake. You'll see, actually, I skipped past a little bit of code earlier because I decided later on, I don't want the snake to be outside of the boundaries of the board. I also don't want the snake to be uh, pressing its head against a wall to start because it might look like something's gone wrong. So I said, hey, I wanna make sure that all of the body positions of the snake are valid. And I also wanna make sure that the position of, uh, that the snake is 
the position that is one ahead of where the snake is traveling is also inside of the board, right? I'm using this is valid position constructor one more time to check that that is also within the boundaries of our play space, if that makes sense. So let's upload that to a table. And we'll check it out. So you'll see when I reset here, you may have seen it just there. Now the snake starts in a random position. And similarly, I can move around the board. I can eat food. I can make my snake grow longer. And once it's long enough, I can crash into myself and we get a game over. If I reset, we'll see we'll start in a totally different place. So we're making use of, we're, we're again, <laughs> Let me let me reiterate this. This is not about learning how to program Snake, and I, I I wouldn't blame you if you were off, you know, reading Reddit while I'm uh, while I'm blathering on here in the background. That's totally fine. If you are, here's a takeaway from the past five minutes. If you are choosing a random position or a random set of circumstances for something to start in, uh, and you have a lot of checking to do to make sure that that random uh, construct that you started your program with works, this is a useful construction. Use this. Um, uh, do while loop. It, the first thing in your do while loop, say, hey, there is no problem. And then give yourself lots of chances inside that loop to say, no, this, this particular point in checking things off created a problem. And then if we do is, hey, while there is a problem, go back and do it all again, right? So a useful construct to take away from this part of this evening's code, right? So with that, I think that is the, um, that is the final example of the snake code. Um, the only other thing um, that I changed uh, between this and the final version, which you can also find on the website, uh, was a little edge case where I decided that the behavior in the corners should be different. Um, it turned out that uh, it was possible to get stuck in a corner because if you were traveling up, it would allow you to turn right, but not move right. For example, here, I'll show you. If you're in this corner, you are moving right in this case. So it should allow you to turn up, but you can't move up. So it doesn't look like you're moving up. So it seems like, uh, so I, I wrote in some code that you can go and look at on the website under the L example to see how we avoided that situation. Michael says, could you just shrink the valid starting range to avoid the outside border entirely? Would that have unintended consequences? Yeah, for sure. You could definitely uh, pick a starting location that was um, only within the board. One, um, one sort of, uh, I, this is the sort of intuitive way that occurred to me, right? We could say, for example, you know, the the snake's head uh, can start, if we think about where it's allowed to start under the constraints that we've put it on, can start anywhere except the four very extreme corners. Like we could start with a snake's head here because it could be moving in this direction. So those would be the only places the snake's head couldn't be. And then the position of the snake's head would place some constraints on which direction it could be traveling in terms of it couldn't move out of the board, but also its tail would need to only extend in specific directions. So you could you could create the various situations, right? You know, if the snake's head is in the middle of the board, you're relatively unconstrained. If you're closer to the edge of the board, you're somewhat more constrained. Doing it randomly and sort of guess and checking for our limited problem space seemed like a reasonable example to me. But that's also because I can sort of count on this, you know, doing the relatively small number of complications, um, a small number of computations in a reasonable amount of time. If this model space was more complicated, then yeah, you might need to like math it out and figure out, okay, well, the snake's head can, if the snake's head is, ends up randomly being here, then its directions are such and such and so on. Yeah, Kenneth's illuminating the same, a similar thing in chat. You could pick a random direction and a random place, um, and you could sort of model the snake in between those two, for sure. Um, and I'll, that's a, a certain, certainly a valid way to do things. Um, I found the pick a random location and a random direction and see if it works um, to be an approachable one. The others, I guess one advantage of um, the sort of guess and check method it, is that it is based on the same is valid function um, that the sets the boundaries of the game board. So uh, one thing that has occurred to me, though I haven't modeled it yet, is that the, the construction of the is valid function allows you to define um, areas of the game board that act as walls, right? You could say, you know, um, the position four, four and four, five are not valid positions. You cannot, in fact, we can do this right now. Why talk about it when we can do it? Let's just, uh, let's change our is valid position function a little bit and see what our consequences are. Oops, is 
where's our function? There we go. So right now, right now, as constructed, our is valid position function is only recording um, whether it only is sending us true for inside the bounds or false if we're outside the bounds. I'm going to add um, some forbidden positions. I'm going to say um, uh, if uh, x is four and y is four, we're invalid. And if x is uh, four and y is five, we're invalid. Um, and I suppose I should double check that my make food function doesn't allow me to put food in invalid places. I think it currently does. Um, yes. Um, so really, I want this to be in an empty position on the board. And um, really what I should do first is, is valid position x and y and that position is empty, right? So I'm only going to allow my food to appear in a valid position on the board. Let's see if I've typoed. Doesn't look like it. Let's come back to the table and see what happens there. So right now, I shouldn't be able to move my snake into positions four, four, and four, five on the board. Let's see if I can figure out which ones those are. Yeah, so right now, here, I'll, make, I'll move my snake around and get take this head on. Right? If I had my snake moving downward here and it refuses to move into that spot because I've told it that position is invalid. So I suppose, um, so th this is all to say, there is no reason that you still couldn't model your play space um, in a more advanced way than I'm doing, right? This sort of guess and check method is kind of a, um, kind of a brute force one, but by making that initialization function rely on the same food, can I not? Oh, I can't eat the food. Oh, something's gone horribly wrong. <laughs> uh, I forbid myself from eating the food by Subsithian curse. Get over there. Come on, snake. Well, let's crash ourselves here. Oh, my, my button came unstuck from the board. How cruel. Um, by using the same validation function for um, my snake's movement and its initialization, I, that allows me to pretty easily define new areas that are not valid. Um, kind of an interesting side effect. Um, of the way that we're defining um, validity of our space um, using a single function. So yeah, I just uh, just a, a bit of a food for thought, right? If we're if we're defining which positions and which states of our game are valid only in one place, then if we want to change how that functions, we only need to change that that um, deduction of whether something is valid or not in one place in the code. Um, you might think of a 2D adventure game, a 2D top-down adventure game um, that chooses, you know, much like we're basically playing here, right, where we're, we're moving a character around a 2D grid. We could think of um, defining our walls by having them be places where a similar function is, is valid, you know, is valid for movement, is false if there's a wall there. And then if we wanted to um, prohibit fire from ever spawning inside of a wall, say, we could say we use that same is valid function or is valid for movement to say, hey, we can't spawn anywhere that's not valid for movement. Um, so some ways to reuse code that causes similar behavior to happen on both sides. So I think that's it for tonight, y'all. Um, we moved through things, uh, honestly, a little bit quicker than I thought we were going to. Um, but I, I hope it's sort of um, sort of gotten you from how to get from these shift registers um, to uh, to a, a, an eight by eight LED matrix. Chris says, when do you show us how to change the color of the food with this display? Actually, Chris, um, this brings me sort of back to um, a point from earlier tonight, which is what if you don't have a display like mine? What if you have a display like Palmer's that, um, that has a different way of interacting with it? Is this code we've written over the past couple hours any good? Or do you have to throw it all out and start over again? There are um, matrices a lot like this one that have bicolor LEDs, that have red and green LEDs in every position. Um, what if we want to make use of those in our game? Um, what if we want to make use of um, NeoPixels, which we haven't talked about controlling yet, um, but our little serial addressable RGB LEDs arranged in a sort of a, in, in, a, in a, much like you can pass data from one shift register to a next, you can pass data from one RGB LED to the next. Um, do we have to throw everything out and start over again? And the answer is no. Um, much like we talked about earlier, right? All this logic of make food, and temp position and snake direction knows nothing about what the actual output display is. It's just manipulating the, the digits that are in this array. So Palmer, and this would be a fun exercise for the, for the viewer, um, 
the things that you would, would need to update to make this exact game work on your display or another display would be anything that's just in this display update function and possibly the functions that are called by it. So let's look at that display update function, right? So this is where we start to get into knowing that we have to update the rows one at a time and how often, right? You probably would need to alter this. You probably wouldn't make use of this display row function anymore. You would change this code and the display row code to be specific to your display. But other than that, because we really have focused the rest of our code on updating our state variables and updating the state of this 2D array, everything else should just work. By the same token, let's say that uh, instead of four little buttons, you wanted to use a little four position joystick uh, to control this game. Would you have to throw everything away again? Well, no, we've compartmentalized the way we're thinking about things, right? All of our game code just modifies the data in this array. We would only need to modify this check input function and the things controlled by it, right? So right now, the way that we're establishing whether a direction is pressed is by reading these buttons, but you could just as easily read the position of a joystick. Maybe it's an analog value based on the slider. Maybe you're saying, hey, if my trackball has moved more than a certain amount in a given direction since the last time we looked, maybe we need to, maybe that counts as moving in a direction, right? We'd only have to update this one small section of code and everything else would still work. So. Again, if all of this has just been a little bit silly, this way of breaking things apart, right, compartmentalizing what's related to hardware on the input side, what's related to hardware on the output side, and how we're doing the thinking in the middle means that when you're changing your inputs or your outputs or your thinking, those parts don't necessarily reflect each other, right? You, when once we had our display set up and working, Everything else we did, all the rest of this game code was just related to manipulating other variables in the state of this array. And we just took for granted that if we put numbers in this array, they came out the output side. And that was true because we built it to be true. Um, but it's a, it's a good way to start thinking about like separating your ideas of, you know, a function to do output, a function to do input, and a function to do some of the processing in the middle so that things can change on the other side. Um, Color changing displays would be uh, would be a whole uh, we have, we'd have to figure out some way to encapsulate within our array what color things were supposed to be. What well, we certainly could. Um, we could also now I say we could apply a lot of current to uh, the LED only when it's the the food pixel is turned on and cause it to glow extra hot and change color that way. But I think that's probably not a good idea. Um. But yeah, as I was saying, I, that is the that is the conclusion of our project for this evening, which is making this seven segment LED display work. Um, I want to get out for you, um, and you can look at the unfortunate camera angle here. Here, let's just go look at our our pretty game flashing while I grab a teaser for next week's project, which I didn't grab out of the bin earlier, because um, I want to get some back to something that has a little bit more visual flair. Um, because this week has been a lot of staring at words on a screen, which is all well and good but I think we can get into some more fun things. So next week, I want to take a look at another bit of hardware that comes in a lot of introduction to, oh, you could see my uh, my pants the whole uh, <laughs> the whole time. Hi. Um, the, uh... <laughs> whoops. Um, the, then the thing we're going to look at next week is character LCD displays. Um, these come in many different form factors um, that display characters or graphics, but mostly text. Um, on either a two-line or a four-line display. Some of them have backlights, some of them do not. Um, this is, I think, two by 16. You might have a four by 20, but again, whatever display that you're working with, what did I say? Liquid crystal display? LCD display. Oh, <laughs> Ken's pointing out, LCD stands for a liquid crystal display. So an LCD display is like an ATM machine, is like a dip package. So we're just, we're coming full circle tonight with the acronym acronyms, um, but we'll be looking at how to drive these because they are another really useful way as you're building things with Arduino to give yourself immediate feedback. Um, the same way that we've been using the serial console to print things back to the computer to give us a sense of what's going on and what we're programming with, having a little thing that can talk back to you and display text on the screen uh, is gonna be really useful. We might find some other things to do next week. We've talked about some more flashy things at the end of the night tonight, NeoPixels and various other shiny things. So depending on how next week shapes up, we may get into more more flashy things as well. Um, this is a little example of a, a NeoPixel board. So this is four by four RGB pixels. Um, and this one actually has the ability to be four by four buttons as well. So that's kind of a fun thing. Not sort of an, uh, a basic product that you get in your basic kit, but kind of a fun thing to, uh, to add um, as we get to it. Um, 
Oh, displaying all my character. Oh, you're 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 killing me here. Thanks, guys. Um, Chris dropped a request in the chat, so if anyone has has other requests or or other pieces of their kit that they're interested in learning about, please drop them in. I'll respond to Chris's first. Um, request for a future session communication between multiple Arduinos. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, there are several ways to go about doing that. Um, and we should talk about um, Arduino to Arduino communication and also communication between um, Arduinos and sensors or actuators which use methods other than serial to communicate. I think I referenced um, SPI and I squared C earlier tonight, which I just sort of tossed out as acronyms. Those are ways that our microprocessors and or chips, more specifically, communicate with each other. That would make a really good topic for an evening, um, is talking about how SPI and I squared C work. Um, and how they how they allow chips and specifically microcontrollers to communicate with each other. We can also, I think we alluded to, use serial to have one Arduino talk to another um, over a wire or wirelessly, um, which would be a fun thing to touch on. Um, but yeah, for next week, I think we'll we'll start with this as another useful output, and then we'll see we'll see where that drives us. Um, I find these particularly useful when I'm building sort of desktop applications. In fact, um, I, I probably don't have a way to to show you this. Well, maybe I do. Hang on. You look at the still plugged in yeah here we go so if i turn my webcam that was pointed at my computer you can see uh you can see that blue glowing dot in the middle of my screen here this is my little uh radio frequency generator that i built for myself ages ago it has this little four line blue backlit lcd display that tells me what frequency it's operating at and things like that and having a graphical display for things like that is uh is really helpful to tell you what's going on um Chris says Arduino Q lights. Yeah, totally could be a thing. I know um, I know our friend Alec Thorne has been thinking about Arduino to Arduino communication for some Q light purposes. Um, most of what we would look at in terms of that week, I squared C and SPI are sort of shorter range intended protocols on their face um, and would need another physical layer like RS-485 or RS-232 to sort of go over distance. But that would be another thing we could talk about is communication over distance um, would be another fun week. So maybe those things are in our future. Um, yeah, that, those are, those are great ideas. Um, as always, if you have feedback, if you have comments, if you have questions, the easiest way to find me is on Twitter. I'm at Jeffers Glass. Um, you can also comment on this video or leave a comment uh, on the, uh, on the website at jeff.glass slash electronics bash. I see them in all the places and can respond to you there. There's also a contact form on the website. Um, but with that, we will wrap it up. Uh, we finally got it in under 90 minutes, guys. I, it's, uh, you know, if it was, well, if it was daylight savings time twice, we'd get it under 90 minutes. Um, so far, so far we're, we're <laughs> another, another very long one. Um, but, uh, I don't know. It's, it's nice to unwind with y'all, uh, on another lovely Sunday night. I know tonight was a lot of talking at you and a lot of staring at code. So I encourage you to go through either the code in the chunks in the direction that we looked at at this time, um, or go through, um, step by step as we built that code sort of piece by piece and think about the order in which you can sort of start adding chunks of behavior into your code, you know, starting from maybe just get an output working, then get some basic behavior, then get taking some basic input and then build sort of the logic upon that. Um, but uh, yeah, I hope, I hope looking at that code is helpful. Um, we will be back next Sunday night, same bat time, same bat channel here at 7 p.m. Central. Um, uh, you can find a, a link to, of course, all the slides and all the code from tonight at jeff.glasshouse.electronicsbash. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll get updates about what we're uh, <laughs> what we're planning and plotting for the following week. Uh, and if you hit the, hit the subscribe and smash that bell, then you will <laughs> get a reminder when next week's stream is a coming along. Um, but... Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to call it a night, y'all. Thank you for another wonderful Sunday night. Stay healthy out there, and uh, I will see you next time. Thanks, y'all.